based on that phone conversation, I told you I had been submitting open records requests and I was going to continue to submit open records requests, correct? Based off what phone conversation? Based on our conversation in court. Oh, okay. Um, correct. You, you said that you were doing some open records requests, correct? And then based on our conversation, I said we were going to do some additional open records requests. Which open rec records request are you talking about? The same. Because I, I recall open records requests being made for other things, and so I don't know which one that you're referring to. Um, we, at that time, we talked about um, getting, a, I guess it's called a, a county card, and getting access cards and things like that for coming in and out of Fulton County for you, Mr. Wayne, okay. um, and, and all of the access that you all have. Yes, done. yes, and you asked me, did I have an access card? And you are the one that told me that you and Mr. Wayne, or and Mr. Wayne at least had access. I told you that the three of us had an access card because we um, had a contract with the DA's office or the county. Um, I told you what those contracts were and that we had an access card that will allow us to pick up the documents, go into a specific office, and leave out. Okay. And so we talked about, um, about that Correct. And then a couple days later, um, I sent you a text. And then when I say a couple days, so that was on September 12th when we had that conversation. Do you mind if I pull out my phone? Not at all. Okay. On September 14th um, at 6.38 p.m. What day was this? It was September 14th. September 14th, correct. And I sent you a screenshot of a Fulton County Open Records request I did. Yes, and I said, wow. Um, and then, and then we continued to text. Wait, 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 wait. Okay. And then you sent another text about a badge, and I did not respond. You sent another text about an interest card, entrance card. I did not respond. You sent another text about some other badges and with a circle around it, and I did not respond. Yes, okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, Mr. Bradley, if you could just respond to the question asked and only the question asked. That would actually, I, I have an additional okay. thing I want to raise. Ms. Merchant provided some text messages that she let us know that she was going to refer to. Uh, the text messages are inconsistent with Mr. Bradley's. Uh, exchange as he apparently is reading it off of his phone. So if I could ask Ms. Merchant, is this a, it is true, accurate, and complete, um, and perhaps we can see what's on Mr. Valley's phone. But more importantly, I am going to object, I understand the court's leeway that Mr. Sure. Mr. Valley able to establish contact um, based on, on previous uh, statements made. But I'm concerned about going into the content of the, the statements without Putting things in the bucket so that I, I sure, and, and and so am I, Miss Merchant. I'm not seeing so much the relevance of, of it back and forth. I'm allowing you to establish, you know, the contact that was made and in, in line with the outline you re provided me. And I and I think we're on track with that. Were you tendering? Were you planning to tender these text messages? I was planning on discussing them with him. Now, if yesterday he said he didn't talk text about this case, so that was his testimony again today. And yes, I will at least I would show them to him to refresh recollection or um, to impeach him, but. Their, their first part of their argument is foundation, um, is what I'm assuming. They're saying all of these. They're not all relevant. I can give you all of my texts, but they're not all relevant. And so they asked for screenshots, and so I took screenshots. If there is a way to submit my entire text history to Mr. Bradley, then that's fine. If they want us to read every single text, that's fine. I just don't want to be in a position where people are saying that, that, that I'm not. Well, I also want to avoid the situation where you as counsel of record are having to lay the foundation and, and do that sort of thing yourself. So I don't know how much further we can go with this before we get into that. So 
Well, I'm not sure what their objection is. He, so I asked him about one question, and he read Sure. Out Why don't we just go with your next question, and we'll see where we go from there. <coughs> um, all right. <coughs> but, so. And, Bradley, when she, wait for her to ask a question. I, and I understand that, Judge, and I'm not well, trying to. Well, apparently you don't, sir. Wait for her to ask a question, and you'll have a chance. Um, so I think what I, the, the last thing I asked you was about September 14th. Um, so those texts that you're talking about, those refer to the issue that we're here today about them. Some texts said yes. Yes, okay. Um, and then you called me again on September 15th, 2023, and you spoke on the phone. I do not recall that. Well, I texted you and said I needed to call you back, and then I later called you back. I, I'm not sure. I'm not, I do not recall. You don't recall that? Okay. And, um. You recall the following Monday, um, Your Honor, I, I appreciate the, the question um, as it is on the form. And if the question is what she's going to read, I object to it even being asked out loud without knowing, um, number one, the, the relevance of it. If that, if the witness is going to answer the source of information, and I feel like it is so inflammatory, inflammatory as to say out, out loud um, without knowing where Mr. Bradley. Um, Falls on that, then I, I do have an objection to the question. Okay. All right. With all due respect, I might just a moment. Why is it that we're not allowed to ask a question? And then when the question is asked, there's an objection made, either by the state or the lawyers for this particular witness. It appears that what the state would like to do is force us to tell you in advance every question we're going to ask before there's an objection made. And I don't understand why they get to do that. And we are obviously in the same position to say to them, tell us every question you're going to ask first. I realize it's a privilege, but that can be the questions asked, state objects, chauffeur objects, and the court rules. But not being able to put it on the record because it's inflammatory or it's somehow prejudicial, I don't think that I'm just suggesting. Sure. That. So, Mr. Stan, I'd, I'd agree with you. In the general sense of things, but in this situation, Ms. Merchant offered to provide essentially her list of questions in advance, giving us a preview of what she's going to say. And that puts us in kind of a different posture in that respect, where we can actually have some sense of what's going to come out. Um, but Ms. Merchant, I, I think knowing what your next question may be, since usually we don't have that opportunity, uh, does it presuppose some knowledge on his part that we have yet to establish is inside or outside of privilege? Well, the first thing, Judge, is I gave these questions so that, that you wouldn't be in a situation sure. where you were objecting and having four different orders talk about the <coughs> privilege, confidentiality, every single question. So I was hoping that we would ferret that out ahead of time. Um, so this is the first that I've heard <coughs> that objection to question we can't leave the state copies of as well, um, trying to be completely transparent. I also, um, I have to establish that his information, there have been statements in this court that I lied, um, multiple statements yesterday. I can't even tell you how many times that was said under oath yesterday, and that I did not get this information. And so I have a right to. to which I've which I've already said we can do and we can go over, but the and you and we've already started doing that. But the next question, as as you plan to ask it. Uh, may presuppose, again, some information that he has that we need to determine whether it's inside or outside of privilege. Is that right? Um, no. Well, I, I don't believe so, no. I mean, I, if, if we're going to talk about the privilege, I, I wanted to talk about it beforehand, which is why I gave all of these. I, wasn't, I didn't know the state had objections on these questions to privilege. Um, if we're going to talk about the privilege, I'm happy to ask him the substance of the question, but that is what I'm getting objections for. So I'm trying to right. carefully craft something to avoid that. Um, but I'm happy to just ask outright the question. Right. Uh, I don't see a way around that, Ms. Cross. I, I, I understand, Your Honor, I'm going to do what every time they do. Um, the, the problem in the context that Ms. Merchant is posing the question is, this was our communication, this is what I asked you, this is what you told me, and here are these texts that are, that are supporting it. <clears throat> I understand the court's ruling that based on um, how things have gone, if, if Ms. Merchant feels like she needs to establish there was contact and communication, then I don't have an objection to that. However, Number one, the, the text message that exchange that the person gave me is apparently not complete. And so I don't know, if, without making her a witness, how the state can, um, if we're entitled to, if you can refer to text messages, we're, we're entitled to an accurate representation of what those are. So Bradley's looking at his phone, and that's what he's got. He is under no obligation. Ms. Merchant 
provided this to us, and I appreciate it. But I can't tell as I'm sitting here to object to an incomplete or an inaccurate request to tell me if what she gave me is incomplete. So a couple things come to mind. Um, one would be that anything the witness has the, is referring to on the stand, I, a counsel at any point has the right to inspect. And so if that's what you're asking for, Ms. Cross, then I think you have a right to do that, if, if you decided to do that. Um, the other is, is as, as I've seen it so far, I don't think these texts are coming in as substantive evidence, but more for impeachment, in which case extrinsic evidence would never be coming in to prove them up. And he either takes her answer or he doesn't. And that's how it works. So I, I don't see the foundation issue or the completeness issue really playing into it as it comes to impeachment. And so if they ask me for the relevance for impeachment, I took them. It doesn't come out of my mind. I can't download the entire text message history. I told them they could go through my phone. Like, it's, it's, okay. it's, I'm hiding something. All right. All right, Ms. Merchant. Um, I think um, at this point, again, I don't see anything extravagant about the next question <laughs> on his face. I think we need to deal with it as it goes so you Thank can you. proceed. Um, I asked you where I could get an affidavit from about the affair. And you responded, no, because you didn't think anybody would sleep on that bridge. Isn't that true? If you say so. I mean, I don't. Do you have your text if you need to refresh your memory? <coughs> September 18th at 3.11 p.m. in the city. Can you repeat the question? The question is, did I test text you asking you if you knew who I could get an affidavit from about the affair, and you responded no. No one would freely burn that bridge. Yes, I do see that. <laughs> then I asked you if Chris Campbell knew, correct? No, you asked me if under oath, he would testify. Your Honor, again, I'm going to object to the source of the witness's information about that, whether that's first-hand information or not. And Mr. Campbell, of course, has a privilege, too. Um, well, I, since, I, since Mr. Campbell hadn't even been brought in to this proceeding at all, I'm also wondering about just the relevance of asking questions about Mr. Campbell. I, I'm just, it's been objected that I'm not asking about all the texts, and I'm selectively asking, so I'm trying to go through all of them. I would much rather just ask the very relevant ones. Well, I, I, I have an objection to her asking. I can't tell if the statements or the testimony provided is consistent or inconsistent without a complete set of this text exchange. And it's not clear in the text exchange what the source of Mr. Bradley's information that he's providing is. And so that 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 is, I, I'm sorry, sure. and I know everybody else. And, and, and again, I think you're focusing more on the merits than the impeachment value, right? If the sole purpose this is coming in is is under those grounds, then you being able to match them up word for word, I, I don't see that as being the necessary prerequisite. Um, but as it relates to Mr. Campbell, he's not a witness yet, and he hasn't come in. I don't think he's come up really at all other than passing and maybe the firm. So why don't we skip ahead to the next questions, and you could always come back to that if somehow he is made an issue in this case. That's great, Judge. I, I just, I needed some clarity because the, the state is objecting that it's not full and accurate. I'm keeping things out, and then they're objecting that I'm putting too much in. So I'm just trying to avoid um, every question having an objection, Judge. Um, so on January 5th, 2024, we had a text exchange where we talked about um, that I had discovered that Nathan took Fani on a cruise and a trip and paid for it with the business card. You told me you were on a plane home from Dubai, but you would call me as soon as you got home. Do you remember that? So what I have is a text message from you saying, oh, my God, Nathan took funny on a trip to Napa mm -hmm. and paid for it with his firm. Okay. Continue reading. And you said, is he that dumb? Mm -hmm. And I said, wow, I'm on a plane from Dubai. 
Land at three. We'll call you as soon as I land. So that is accurate. That's what you told me. That I will call you as soon as I land and wow? Yes. Yes, that is accurate. And then you told me that you weren't surprised because they took many trips to Florida, Texas, and California. Okay, so I don't have that, but and I can show my phone, but I, I don't have that in my phone. So the question is just, do you recall? I do not recall. Communicating that to me? I do not recall. All right. Do you recall telling me that it was when um, she had to move her daughter a trip to California? I do not recall that. And um, Judge, may I approach the witness? You may. Thank you. Yes, I see this. Okay. Does that look like uh, does it refresh the matter? It does not. I mean, I, I see what's on the text uh, chain, but um, you said this happened January 5th? I can tell you exactly when it happened. Because there's no date and time stamp on that. Let's see. It was, let's see, it was I think that was January 5th. Just Judge, I, I just want to, on behalf of Mr. Wayne, just to review the again. Would we still to, which, to which question? To the current question. We still don't know the source of this information, whether it was privileged or how we obtained it. I'm wondering now if there's a timeliness issue on your objection since he already, well, he asked, he said he just, he doesn't recall. Right. So there's. He, he just gave the date. He didn't. Sure. Sorry. Well, his, his question or his answer was he doesn't recall and his memory has not been refreshed. So I think it's time for the next question. Um, may I approach the witness, Judge? Okay. Can I see what you're okay. approaching the witness, please? Is this the complete text change? Yeah, this is the complete text While they're looking at that, can I just ask you, did you delete any text messages? I, I have several messages in the phone with you. I don't, I, I've never deleted. I mean, there are messages about family and my health and mm -hmm. things like that. You asked me to be on some panel. Yes. Um, and so I, you know, I, I think it's complete, but. Well, no, my question was, did you delete anything? No, I, I haven't deleted anything. Bro. Okay. I have not. And I offered them to look through my phone earlier if they are welcome to. You never provided them to it. I said you. Physical you phone, you never provided it. <laughs> it's right. the only phone I have, Judge. Yeah. I, I understand, and I don't want to keep popping up, but my concern, of course, is that these exchanges are just two lawyers gossiping about information. And I'm, I'm concerned about it coming into the record in this way. I understand impeachment is a thing, but if we could um, do it in a way that the substance of this gossip is not, um, that part is not impeaching. The contact is impeaching. So I, I don't think we've gotten to that point quite yet, Ms. Cross, but you can renew your objection if you think we have. So right now, the sole thing that Ms. Merchant is trying to do is hand him an object to refresh his recollection again. So we'll see where we get with that. And I don't have any way to download it. Mr. Seda. The court is a trier of that. You're going to be able to determine whether something that has come in that you choose is hearsay, whether it's admissible, whether it's relevant, whether it's impeachment. You're in a position that if it all comes in, but you 
um, reserve the right, or all parties reserve the right to object, uh, we can deal with it. This is not a jury. We don't have to worry about the jury hearing something that it will no longer consider. All we're doing now, with all due respect, and I understand that there's a process, the state doesn't want something to be heard. I object to that. They've <laughs> repeatedly attempted to stop questioning. Your Honor can hear it all and then decide what is and is not relevant and admissible. We don't have to go through every single one of these. The only time we have to go through this is if it is in fact a communication and it's a privileged communication and an argument has to be made at that point as to whether or not it should be elicited or it is subject to being stated in open court. Otherwise, all of this could come to the court and the court can then decide how it wants to treat it. That's all right. Uh, I appreciate that, Mr. Sadon. I think you're it's certainly accurate that we could have an approach where if it's a close toss-up on an evidentiary question, we can have it all come in and sort it out later on the record. Uh, I, I, I don't think we've quite reached the point where I need to do that. I think we still have time to get into these, and, and it would be my preference to keep the record as clean as possible and without questionable evidentiary issues. Uh, but we may get to that point. So. The question from Ms. Merchant was to approach the witness and with an object to see if that would refresh his recollection to the last question asked. Yes. Now, I'm sorry, the state scrolled through it, so not right there again. No, I mean, like, it was on the screen. <clears throat> I can't find it. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to move on to the next question that I actually can't find, and then I'll find that and come back to it. Um, I sent you um, a statement and said, upon information and belief, Willis and Wade met while both were serving as a magistrate judge in and began a romantic relationship at that time, and you corrected me and say, no, it was in municipal court. Is that correct? I think that's pretty accurate. And is that based on your personal knowledge? The, what question? Was it municipal court or when they first met or my question was is this accurate upon information and belief willis and wade met while both were serving as magistrate judges and began a romantic relationship at that time and you wrote know that it was municipal court okay so, so i answer rather just a second no, mr chopra has risen all right um your honor <laughs> uh, i do have one purpose here and that purpose has now been met. Um, any information that Mr. Bradley may possess would in fact have come from his representation of Mr. Wade. This falls within the purview of his divorce proceedings, which as we testified earlier, commenced in December of 2018. There's no pierce or shield associated with it, and so we would say that under Rule 1.6 we should not be compelled to give any further information. Okay, and as we discussed about before the uh, break, Mr. Chopra, if I ruled earlier this morning that uh, this witness is going to be uh, directed to respond to any question to the extent it falls outside of attorney-client privilege and only attorney-client privilege, meaning one point is, is not going to bar his testimony in this case. What would be your response then? Then uh, Mr. Bradley would have to consistently assess on his own, unless I'm jumping up and objecting for him, whether or not this came within his knowledge based on his representation. Now, I can say based on the phrasing of the question from Ms. Merchant, it would in fact come within information obtained from his partner client at the time associated with the activity in question. All right. Mr. Um, Mr. Evans, same issue? Uh, I just want to reiterate that that's a, it's a compound question anyway, so it needs to be separated out. But it's still based, we, we, we just renewed the objection that it's still based on gossip, either gossip or privileged communication. He doesn't ever cite the source of where any of this information is coming from, so I just wanted to repeat that objection. Okay. 
Judge, Merchant. as far as privilege, um, any privilege objection, it's been waived, particularly for this issue because Mr. Wade. You did testify on this subject. Testified on this subject. Well, he didn't, excuse me, he didn't testify as a communication with his attorney about any subject. He testified factually about what trips he took and events that occurred. He didn't testify, to, to my recollection, about any communication with his attorney. But he, he testified about the subject matter of the question that was just asked, which was when uh, apparently they first met. Furthermore, but, Judge, my client wasn't privy to that testimony. We have been under subpoena and therefore under the rules, so we do not know what was or was not sure. testified to. Everything he says would be a violation of that privilege unless we know specifically what all has been waived. Sure. Unless I make a finding that there was an express waiver on behalf of the client. Yes. Per question. Right? Okay. And, and, uh, sure. Got it. So all for right. this question particularly, Judge, we would ask that you find that there has been a waiver of the attorney-client privilege because Mr. Wade testified to something directly different than what this witness, we believe, has okay. Ms. Cross? Yeah, so I, Mr. Wade testified as to when they met. That is not the entire substance of the text message that Ms. And began a romantic relationship. Yes. He did not testify that they okay. were serving as magistrate judges when they began a romantic relationship. All right. He testified differently. Okay, Ms. Merchant, I think you're going to need to establish whether this witness ever gained that knowledge independently or during the course of a attorney-client relationship. Um, did you have any, uh, thinking back to the source of your knowledge, and, and let me just, before I do that, let me remind you of what is covered by attorney-client privilege. It's communications that relate to matters in which legal advice is sought and communications that have been maintained in confidence and no exceptions to the privilege. So it's communications that are in furtherance of legal advice. Your knowledge that their affair began, that their romantic relationship, I'm sorry, began um, while they were both serving as municipal court judges. Is that from your personal information, your personal knowledge, or is that from? I'm going to overrule that objection, Mr. Chopra. He can answer that question. State that question again. Your knowledge? Is, is any knowledge, if any? If any knowledge of Nathan Wade and Fonnie Willis's relationship, romantic relationship beginning while they were both serving as judges, is any knowledge that you have from your own personal knowledge or something that was told to you in furtherance of legal advice? I have no personal knowledge of when it actually happened. Um, I was not there. I do not have any personal knowledge, so okay. I would choose not to answer that question under 1.6. Okay. Um, Mr. Bradley, we, we made a distinction earlier. Yes, sir. That it's a bit narrower than that. Okay. 1.6 is in I have no personal knowledge, Judge. I apologize. Okay. If you were that's, that's, not, that's not a problem. The issue is, is attorney-client privilege, and so whether what you learned, if anything, was during communications with a client. It was. Okay. Ms. Merchant. And, and was it that... Any knowledge that you had as to the truth of that statement, was it told to you in furtherance of legal advice? I'm going to object to that. If that statement is true, that's all right. And the witness has already testified he has no personal knowledge about that. So whether he represented at one point it was true or not true, he has no personal knowledge about that, so could not testify. Prior and consistent statement, Judge. Do it all the time. That is what the state it's does regularly. They bring in, if it's a prior inconsistent statement of another witness, Judge. This, it, Mr. Which, Wade which testified. Which other witness? I'm okay. sorry. Okay, Mr. Wade testified. That this, that their relationship did not start. But you can't impeach him with a prior inconsistent statement that's privileged. And so we're still, we, we haven't gotten over the privilege hurdle. The privilege, the privilege hurdle we've gotten over with fraud on this instance. Well, we have, that's the first time you use that word. So if you want to make the argument of why that applies, you can do that now. Yes, Judge. The crime fraud exception. It applies because of the crime fraud exception. Um, Which crime and or fraud was committed here? So there's a couple different things, and, and I want to just address them both because he's raised 1.6 and also raised attorney-client privilege. Um, for the crime fraud exception says the privilege doesn't apply if it's um, – if the existence of it, essentially if he has to keep something secret to allow a, a fraud upon the court to continue. So we've got that. We've also got... Um, no, it, it has to, if the legal communications have to have done in furtherance of a crime or fraud. How has that been established? And what, again, what crime or fraud are we talking about? 
We're talking about perjury, lying to the court. In the affidavit filed last month. Yes. And so what have you done to link the communications that he made maybe, I don't know, years ago to the affidavit filed last month? The communications he made years ago? It's, it's proof of the it's proof of the affidavit being incorrect, being false. He's given, it, he's it given a prior be, inconsistency. But statement. the legal communication has to be in furtherance of a crime or fraud. Right. That... Right, but he also can't protect. So, and I think it's more under. But, um, but if he had no, if there, we, an affidavit wasn't even going to need to be filed until a month ago. Right. And these communications and everything happened well before that. How is anything that they communicated in furtherance of that affidavit that they didn't even know would have to be filed one day? It's just it's been waived. That part's been waived because he filed the affidavit. So you can't you can't file something that's false and then your lawyer know that it's false and then say, oh well, privilege. My lawyer can't correct that. When he waived the privilege, and he waived the privilege, he testified about this yesterday. Okay, Ms. Cross. I, I, I don't think that's even close to an accurate representation of what the law in this area is. And beyond the real um, kind of <coughs> throwing out fraud and this and crimes, um, which what you have, Your Honor, is a conflict in the evidence at this point. I know which way. The weight of the evidence appears to me that that's going to be for the court to judge. But conflict in the evidence, that is not a crime. That is not a fraud. That is not a perjury. That's a conflict in the evidence for the court to review. So I, I agree with you there that you would have to first establish a crime or a fraud occurred by a preponderance. Got it. And uh, any, anything else? Just that she can't, under the guise of impeachment of this witness, you know, one, establish that. Number two, the witness has already said he doesn't have any personal knowledge of that. And there is no, the kind of specificity that is required to um, lay the predicate for a crime fraud exception to the attorney client privilege is nowhere close to being met here. Okay. Uh, anyone else want to be heard? Mr. Sadow. Yes, Your Honor. This is what I said to the court earlier. This is not crime fraud. The scenario in the case I said you want me to decide to direct. Uh, go for it. Owens Corning Fiberglass Corporation versus American Centennial Insurance Company et al. And it is 660-92812 out of the state of Ohio, Lucas County, Court of Common Pleas of Ohio. And it references and they show the right page here. I think it's page 256. The point in the case, or the holding in the case, if the party or witness chooses to testify falsely, and our position is that Mr. Wade testified falsely when he claimed the relationship did not begin until 2022, that if there are attorney-client communications in which the same individual witness has told his attorney something contrary to that, inconsistent with that, here that the relationship, the personal romantic relationship between Mr. Wade and Ms. Willis began prior to November 1st of 2021, which would be the day that he was hired, that if that communication took place, that is, the attorney communication, that the fraud upon the court is Mr. Wade lying under oath about the starting date, and the attorney-client privilege under those circumstances where that material fact is pierced, and the attorney may be forced to testify to the contrary or inconsistent statement so that the, the fraud on the court no longer holds. In our situation, that is precisely what we are trying to do. If this witness is testimony, yes, and, and the court may, ha may have to hear some of this ex parte in camera to determine, but if this witness is able to testify that Mr. Wade told him, under whatever the circumstances may be, that the relationship with Bonnie Willis began before November 1st of 2021, then we know from the, that the witness has testified to Mr. Wade that he lied under oath to the court, and that's a fraud upon the court, and the attorney-client communication, that that 
specific matter is pierced and needs to go into record. Now, how best to do that? The only way to do that, if it's not in writing, and apparently it's not, is for the court to hear uh, in camera, ex parte, what the communications were that are sought to be kept privileged. If the court deems that it is not inconsistent or contrary to what's testified, then you wouldn't pierce the privilege. If, on the other hand, this witness honestly, that is, now we're talking about Mr. Bradley, actually testified to what he has told in text messages to Ms. Merchant on behalf of Mr. Roman, that he absolutely knows that the relationship started before November 1st of 2021, then he's testifying that his client took the stand and lied under oath and therefore did a fraud upon the court. So okay. my request is, in this regard, the court's going to have to hear from counsel, and from, that is, counsel from Mr. Bradley, and from Mr. Bradley to determine whether or not he actually said what he said to Ms. Merchant and whether or not it was based on communications, whatever it took place with Mr. Williams. All right, Mr. Seda, I understand. Uh, thank you for clarifying your argument there. So I understand this fraud upon the cart theory. And what I'd been going back and forth with Ms. Merchant on earlier was that, as I understood, crime fraud applied in Georgia was that the communications had to have been in furtherance of a crime. And to me, that presupposes the existence of a crime at the time or the forming of one at the time of the communications. The theory you're putting forward is one where we go back in time and can reopen that box because it's now become relevant for something completely, potentially unconnected to the communications whatsoever. Is that fair? That falsity has occurred now right. by the very person who is attempting to use the communications as a shield to sure. protect yeah. his lives. Okay. That's, and when I say crime fraud, I, there, it's a fraud waiver is what, and that's what Millich calls it ex, is essentially. Um, I mean, Millich says that, it doesn't offend the privilege to ask an attorney to testify to matters already freely discussed by the attorney and a client at another hearing or proceeding, um, allowing a client to selectively waive and reassert the privilege as tactics, dictates, um, suggests that the client is using the privilege as a sword and not merely a shield. Sure. So um, I think it was quite explicit that Mr. Wade never waived anything regarding to communications between him and Mr. Bradley. He was willing to discuss the subject matter, uh, but he was never willing to get into communications that occurred between him and Mr. Bradley. So. As to Mr. Sadow's point of this fraud upon the court theory, uh, my question is going to be, has it ever been applied in Georgia? And the answer to that is, it's not a case that's been applied in Georgia. I cannot find a case in which it has been applied. The cases that I have, the case that I gave you plus the cases cited in there, um, are the only thing I've been able to locate. Although, I think that the bar rules, if we want to go back to those, and I don't have any you, that's a lawyer should not allow his client to commit the fraud upon the court. Okay. And I think that, along with this, gives the court the discretion to do that. And the only way to make the record, even if the court suggests that this is the law that the court should apply, but even if the court disagrees, there's no way for there to be a record about it unless Your Honor does it ex parte in camera to determine the nature of the privilege, which, of course, Your Honor knows from earlier days is how judges can do it with the Fifth Amendment privilege. They can do it with any privilege as long as it's ex parte in camera. So what I'm asking the court to do, because when I get up, I'm going to ask them directly. Um, I'm not going to go through this, um, what's going on now, to find out whether or not um, Mr. Wade has ever told Mr. Um, Bradley in his capacity as his attorney or otherwise that the relationship started earlier than what Mr. Wade justified. All right, understood. So um, my, the big takeaway I'm hearing from that, Mr. Seda, is that once again, we're hearing the words, a matter of first impression here, uh, and uh, noted. Mr. Gillen. Yeah, very quickly, Your Honor. Um, number one, he apparently, that now he's claiming a privilege, which he certainly did not assert when he was communicating in a text. Sure, but do we have any indication Mr. Wade waived it and allowed him to communicate by that text? Well, uh, we know what he did. We know what he did. And so how is that an implied assume, waiver? And I would assume that as the attorney that he would know whether or not he should be protected a communication. That's a pretty not big assumption, right? Not all communications are protected, number one. Number two, let's not forget how we started on this journey with the state getting up and making very serious allegations against this person, uh, asking for sanctions, saying all of her representations were inaccurate. And now... They are doing whatever they can to 
block access to that information, which shows exactly what she said was exactly the truth. What they're trying to do is they're trying to say to the court, the 100% accuracy of Mr. Wade's declaration and of his testimony, and by the way, please, please, judge, don't let Mr. Bradley tell you what he knows, because what he knows is that this relationship, based upon what we see from the, from the text and what we've seen in the context, we show that the relationship started before November 2021. So I think there, we, you know, we have a waiver issue, and parenthetically on the issue of crime fraud, Your Honor, the issue about crime fraud is whether or not in any context the communication would be not in furtherance of a crime at that time, but it could be for any, any particular crime committed by the client in the future as well. It doesn't have to be something that's being committed at the time. I will also note that the, when you look at the attorney-client privilege, the law basically says, look, this is a privilege which blocks, blocks evidence from coming in. And so in order to have that, they have the crime fraud exception, which is a very low standard once a prima facie showing has been made, which I believe has been done by Ms. Lynch. All right. Let me clarify one thing. Mr. Bradley, when you testify to personal knowledge, does that include anything you may have seen, heard, outside of communications with a client? When you say you lack personal knowledge, does that include anything you may have seen or heard outside of communications with a client? And you can tell me if that question is horribly phrased. You're trying to rephrase it for me, Judge? I'm sorry. Okay. When you say you lack any personal knowledge. Yes, sir. Does that also mean that and include anything you may have seen or heard outside of communications? Outside of communications with my client. That's correct. Okay. And the communications that were made, if any, that relate to the subject that you were asked to, were there any other third parties present that may have resulted in a waiver of privilege? Including texts. Am I answering your question or her question? Okay. Were there any other third parties ever present with you and a client that would have resulted in a waiver of these privileges? No, Judge. I can't recall anybody being present. I mean, we ran an office. We had people around our office. But, no, I can't say that there were other people present. All right. And did you ever receive any kind of a waiver from your client at any point? I have not received a waiver. And anything that you learned regarding the subject matter at all, if anything, was it in the course of legal advice, of receiving or giving legal advice? That's a broad question, Judge, to answer because the advice was given. And then you have interaction. I mean, it wasn't, hey, this is for, to say specifically, this was for that. You know, I can't sit here and say that. So I don't know how to answer that question, Judge. Okay. All right. So. I was given a case that may reflect the same proposition in regards to the Trump case. It's an old case. It's Atlanta Coca-Cola Bottling Company versus Goss, G-O-S-S. 50 Georgia Appeals, 637. It appears to be a 1935 decision. I have not had the benefit of jeopardizing it. So I can't say that for certain. It hasn't been limited or overruled. It looks like it's in reference to maybe head note number two, at least the one I'm looking at on the computer. The language that it 
in the case, okay, is uh, as the violations of law or commission of fraud, the protection only extends only to communications after the act or transaction is finished. It does not cover communications respecting proposed infractions of the law and the commission of the crime or the perpetration of the fraud. And then it cites some cases. And then it goes, the privileged communication may be a shield, may be a shield of defense as to crimes already committed, but it cannot be used as a sword or weapon of offense to enable persons to carry out contemplated crimes against society, frauds, or perjuries. So our position, as I indicated before, is the witness, Mr. Wade, has committed perjury on the witness stand. We call it into question the statement. All right. I'm just going to say that, Mr. McDougall. Uh, Your Honor, this is uh, adjacent Georgia law, uh, perhaps not controlling it. I'll explain that in just a second. That's rule of professional conduct 3.3 A2. A lawyer shall not knowingly fail to disclose a material fact to a tribunal when disclosure is necessary to avoid assisting a criminal or fraudulent act of the client. A4, and the reason that I would qualify that, right, since we're talking about candidate report, I need to do that. I believe this rule is regarding the conduct of advocates representing clients in court. It might not govern or control the situation where the lawyer has been put on the stand, but it's adjacent to the point that you say that I made earlier. All right, fair point. Okay, um, Mr. Trooper, anything you want to address on that? Thank you, Judge. And Clearly, there's a lot of smarts in this room, but this whole thing is a deductive fallacy. Um, it is suggested that the truth of the conclusion of the argument necessarily follows from the truth of the premises given, when in fact the conclusion does not necessarily follow the premises. They you know, called him a perjurist. He's, he, he has officially succeeded in saying the thing itself is true, therefore we must ask these other questions and judge it's, it's a fallacy it does not exist as such and the privilege should still apply all right uh thank you all so uh, i think here is what we need to do as i understand uh the law um as, as i find it the the crime fraud exception only applies when by preponderance we found that communications made in the existence of a relationship were in furtherance of a crime or the client at the time knew or reasonably should have known uh, that a crime, uh, that the attorney was being used to further a crime. I don't think that's been established here. Maybe something happened afterwards, and that's something that can be argued during, during uh, closings, essentially. So I don't think the crime fraud exception uh, covers this. The objection is preserved for the record. Uh, Mr. Bradley has indicated also that anything he learned about this subject occurred during those communications. There's some uncertainty on that point, and so in order to preserve the record, um, at the conclusion of the, the hearing, uh, I think I can go in camera with Mr. Chopra and Mr. Bradley, and we can uh, put in a sealed filing uh, exactly what the extent of those communications were, um, if any were relevant. Or excuse me, not relevant, but just what they were, and those would remain sealed and, uh, until some time, if we're ever directed uh, otherwise. However, at this point, the question, uh, getting back to the question asked by Ms. Merchant, um, as asked, uh, would be sustained on the issue of, of privilege, the premise. He may um, have told you something, but it does not appear that there's any evidence that the client ever waived and allowed that information to be conveyed to you. Next question. Thank you, Judge. Um, all right, let's see. So. Um, we talked about um, Ms. Willis and Mr. Wade coming to and from your office and security details um, following them. Do you recall that? Do I need to look at my phone? No. I'm I, just asking if you recall. Oh, do I recall? I, I think I did, yes. Do you recall security taking Ms. Willis to your office? I'm going to check to that. Um, Does he recall Ms. Willis that. taking security? You can answer the question, sir. Um, I do recall um, security detail bringing Ms. Willis to my office. Okay. Do you recall approximately when that was? I do not. 
and um, was that on more than one occasion? I remember two occasions. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> Can you tell me about those? I can't remember when they were. Um, were they before she became DA? So I don't know if she had security detail before she became DA. So, I mean, if she if she was sworn in or I, I don't remember the dates, um, but I do remember. Um, I, I think she was DA. Um, Maybe during her transition team period. Was that? No, it wasn't. Um, I'm trying to remember. She would have had to have been the DA, I, I, I think. Um, and I, I don't want to go on, I think. Um, but I do remember twice um, her coming to our office, correct? And she had a security team both of those times? There was a... Yes, she has a security team with her. Okay. Um, and do you believe that it's a different security team than she has now? I don't know her security team now. Well, yeah. um, however... Oh, I'm sorry. I, I don't know her security team now. Um, <clears throat> I don't know her security team now. Do you remember telling me that it changed at some point, her security team? Yes, I, I think I recall saying that, yes. And that the most likely people that, that could testify or had seen things about them having a romantic relationship early on would be the original security team. I don't recall saying that, no, but... Do you recall talking to me about other people that might have known about their romantic relationship? I recall... Yeah, I, I, objection based on, we all know the source. <coughs> this, this is either based on privileged information or it's hearsay. Neither one. It, it's neither. I asked if you're uh, you, you need to clarify it. If you're actually going to think, if you think that this draws on information from outside the relationship that we've already, he's already testified to, then you need to lay that foundation. Um, so sustained. Are you aware of other people that you believe would have known about when their relationship began? I object to the relevance of that. Again, the witness has testified he has no firsthand information of it. Anything he knows about the topic came from representation. Who he thinks might have been able to say something else is speculation, not relevant to anything, and a backdoor to get in the gossip and innuendo that has been pretty much this entire. All right. Okay, Ms. Merchant, I think we're getting to the point where. You know, the, the reason I, was, I thought this line of, of questioning was appropriate was to rebut certain inferences about why we were here in the first place. Right. But to go into it at the granular level, I'm, I'm not as wild about. So if maybe you can ask more overarching <coughs> questions, and if you have anything else you think that's relevant, then you can get to those as well. Um, isn't that true that I gave you a copy of the motion to disqualify in this case? I emailed it to you, and you read it, reviewed it, and emailed me back that everything in it was accurate, to your knowledge. You emailed me, and I, you, okay, all right, so there are things contained within that, Ms. Merchant, which he has now said uh, fell within the privilege, and that he did not have the ability to waive, so that's where we have to leave it there. And I believe I still have to ask the questions, and then if he wants to assert the privilege, I think Well, I think he's pretty much already established the privilege, and the objection has been made, and I think it's a, a valid one at this point based on the record. So the answer was, he did acknowledge that you sent him the motion, and I think we leave it at that. Um, let's see. Um, and you had, you had knowledge about an apartment, and I'm not asking what Mr. Wade told you in furtherance of legal advice, but you had knowledge about an apartment in East Point or a condo in East Point that, um, 
was owned by someone and Miss Willis was staying there. Judge, I, I think in the way the question's phrased, she, she qualified that, so. Yeah. I did not have knowledge. You did not have knowledge. I did not have personal knowledge at all, no. So no knowledge outside of what is privileged. That's correct. Um, are you, did you have texts between um, yourself, Ms. Willis, and Mr. Wade? Do I? Have you ever? I, I have. Maybe once or twice, but. <laughs> Did Mr. Wade ever ask to use your credit card to pay for trips? Objection. Um, I'm, uh, I'm just asking to use your credit card. How is that in the nature of furthering a divorce proceeding? I had a business card, and we would use my business card. The firm would use my business card. For travel? Are you asking if I use my business card for travel? Would Mr. Wade use your business card for travel? <clears throat> I recall um, I, I recall a trip um, but I don't know if that trip has anything to do with this case. So I do recall him using my card once. When was that? And I, I don't even know when that was, and that's not true. Um, I recall him using my card once. But I cannot remember what that was for. I do remember it was a trip, but I cannot uh, actually state, you know, where it was and who it was with or anything like that. And he paid you back for that trip in cash? I can't remember how he paid. I, I think it. I think it was. I mean, I. I'm not. I'm not certain if it was cash or check. Um, we re routinely would use. Uh, my card um, for filings for um, paper for whatever stuff with the office and so oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. and so he would whether he paid me back in cash or whether he wrote a check uh, you know it was paid back to the business card and but this was the only time he had used it for travel <sighs> I cannot recall. I don't even have that business card anymore. Um, but I do recall at least once for travel, yes. And um, that was when you were still law partners with him, though, correct? That is correct. Do you recall approximately when that was? I do not. Um, you did not go on that travel with him, though, correct? I did not. Okay. And so he asked you to use your card for the travel. Yes, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming. Um, I mean, he, we would use the card for firm stuff. And so it was a business card. Your business card, don't It was know. my business card, yes. Right. The law office of Terrence A. Bradley, correct. Okay. So it showed up on your accounts? That is correct. Okay. okay. Wouldn't show up on his accounts, though, correct? That, that would be accurate, yes. Um, do you know if this was before he became special DA in this case, special prosecutor? I cannot recall. Um, did you see he and Ms. Willis together? You said you were in and out of the office, in and out of the um, DA's office. You saw them together, correct? In and out of my office or the DA's office? The DA's office. Correct. You saw them together in and out of the DA's office. Did I see them in and out? Yes. Um, well, if you preface it like that, no. I saw him 
in and out of the office when I would be there doing my filter work for the Taint team. Right. He would come by. I rarely saw Miss Willis and Mr. Wade together in the DA's office. Who brought up the Taint team? Let's talk about that for a minute. Tell me about um, you did work as you had a contract as a Taint lawyer, correct? That is correct. Okay. And that was in the anti corruption unit? Um, I, yes, I think so. Yes, correct. And how did you get that contract? What do you mean, how did I get it? How did you get the contract? Um, it was... Did, did you apply online? Oh, no. Um, it was proposed. Um, By who? We were, um... It was proposed by... I guess it came from the district attorney. I mean, I, I didn't... Um, I didn't speak directly with her. Okay. It was um, with Mr. Wade, and he asked if we would be interested um, in having a contract with the Fulton County. Okay. Um, he asked and I said you I would. Mr. Campbell? Uh, I think so. I mean, it, I, I can't recall if he asked us both together or not. Uh, rarely. Um, we all handled several, I mean, uh, different things for the firm, okay. criminal, personal injury, uh, things like that, uh, family law. And so rarely were we together um, there at the same time, like for an abundance of time. So he may have called me and then he may have called Chris. I can't remember, I can't recall um, how we got the contract, but. Did, um, was Mr. Wade, to your knowledge, part of the transition team for Ms. Willis? To my knowledge, he was part of the transition team. Did he spend a lot of time at that office during this transition period? He did. So from when Ms. Willis took office to when you left the firm, did Mr. Wade spend most of his time at the DA's office? You said most of his time, are you saying just working business hours yeah, or? Working business hours. I would say he spent, um, I would probably say he spent majority of time. If you say over 51%, I would say yes, he spent over 51% of his time. Okay. And that was the entire time from when she took office to when you left the firm? I can't say that that was the entire time, but yes, it was majority of, um, it was a, I mean, I can't pinpoint specifically when the time that he would spend, um, I think, um, if my memory serves correctly, getting to the majority of the time, it would have been, um, Whenever he started with this, maybe with that was as a special prosecutor. When you say majority of the time, right? Okay, so let's talk about the time before he became special prosecutor. Did he spend a lot of time at the DA's office then? He spent time. I mean, it depends on what you say is a lot. Um, he spent time at the DA's office, correct? And so, just so we're clear, you were hired first um, on January twenty fifth. Both you and Mr. Campbell were law partners, and you were both hired by the DA uh, January. 25th, 2021, is that correct? Repeat the question, I'm sorry. You and Mr. Campbell yes. both um, were hired mm -hmm. on a contract basis by DA Willis mm -hmm. January 25th, 2021, correct? Which contract are you talking about? The first one, the tank contract. Not the first appearance contract, the tank okay. contract. Well, you said the first one, and the tank contract wasn't the first contract, and so... Okay, so the so what was the first contract? To my knowledge, the first contract was the first appearance. So, um, let me just mark these and see what number we are. 23, 24, 25. Judge, when they're done reviewing, <laughs>
Riley showing you what's the mark? Because I said at 23, 24, and 25, if you get a look at those. I see. So on um, now that you've reviewed those, is it true that on January 25th, 2021, you got your first contract as a taint lawyer? As a taint lawyer, yes. I see the date on, on that as a taint lawyer, but I'm also looking at this contract here um, for first appearance. And there, you know, there must have been... I don't have it before me, but there must have been a contract before this. Okay, so you think there's a fourth contract? I, I can't say that there is or isn't. What I do know is that we did first appearance during COVID, and it was before 2021. So I don't know, um, you know, if I had a contract, a written contract at that particular time or anything, but... I do know, I think that the, I mean, it's, you can look at the recordings because everything was recorded at that time um, as to when the, fir the first appearance contract started and the taint contract started. So when the three of you were partners, you had at least two contracts to do taint work, which is um, filter work, um, and then a con two, at least two contracts to do first appearance work, pretty much throughout that entire two years, right? Well, it renewed. So... I mean, um, it just renewed. So to, uh, yes, I mean, if it, it was the same contract, but it was a renewal of okay. the contract. So, so how did you? And you said you got you got these contracts through Miss Willis gave them to you, but it was through her knowing Mr. Wade, correct? <coughs> yes, um, I didn't have a. A meeting with Miss Willis or anything. Um, it was it was brought to the attention that um, a contract was going to be needed or awarded, um, and if we or if I was interested because this was uh, off of mine, and I said yes, and so. And so, Mr. Wade brought that to your attention. He asked if I was interested in doing the contract correct. And then after that is when Ms. Willis, you know, would come in or I think we actually came down here or something um, and signed the contract. Okay. Um, and so that is how you were paid um, from Fulton County, these contracts? From, from Fulton County government? Yes, ma'am. And you shared um, your partnership. You shared a third of all your profits with Mr. Wade. At that time, yes. And so his contracts, he got a contract that same year, 2021, and he shared a third of all his profits with you, correct? Yes, that should be fairly accurate. Okay. So during 2021, 2022, you all had two filter taint contracts. You had two first appearance contracts, and you had Mr. Wade's special counsel contracts, correct? My firm had what I have here, okay. correct? 
But Mr. Campbell and Mr. Wade were part of your firm, correct? <clears throat> so we didn't, I don't think at this time we had established WBC. Okay. Um, at this time, I think it was, I had mine, Chris had his, Nathan had his, and we operated in the same building. But if you ask me, did we fee share or, you know, without everything that came in, yes, that is correct. So you weren't actually partners, you just fee shared? At this time, mm -hmm. well, yes, at this time, we were not. If okay. we were at this time, I had law officer Terrence Bradley, um, Chris Campbell, PC, and whatever uh, Nathan's was, if I'm not mistaken. I'm just. And all these, con the taint contracts and the Nathan special counsel contracts, all of those were under the anti corruption unit, correct? Good First on. appearance was not under that. Uh, the taint contract, I, if I recall, was under. The um, I, I don't I don't think they called it. What what are you calling it? You can take a look at your contract if you need. Okay. And I'm I'm not asking about the first appearance. I'm asking about the taint contracts mm -hmm. and then Mr. Wade's contract, which has already been admitted in evidence. If you need to look at that. when you're done reviewing? Well, I see on the first page where it says taint attorney, and I'm, I'm trying to go through and I see where it continues says taint attorney, but it always says Fulton County District Attorney's Office. Your question was specific as to the anti-corruption unit, and I'm looking for the verbiage of anti-corruption unit, so I apologize. Oh, no, take your time. see on both pages I mean it starts out Fulton County District Attorney's Office and then it just goes to initials FCDA um, unless I'm overlooking where it says the anti-corruption unit then the contract was with the FCDA I mean unless you want to show me something uh, I'm just asking you and I didn't know if that would refresh your memory those Contracts were for the anti-corruption right? Well, they were for the district. I worked for the DA. Okay. I worked for the DA. Okay. So just in general, the DA. Correct. I worked for Fulton County District Attorney's Office in a con uh, as a uh, contract person, as it says here. Okay. And um, the when you did the taint work, you had to report to Sonia Allen. I did not. You did not. Who did you report to then? I can't remember his name. His, his first name was Brian. Okay. And um, so I know you said you met with Miss Willis when you signed those contracts, right? Yes, I know I met at least one time to sign these contracts or to sign when I signed the contracts, yes. Did you meet with her any other times? I did not personally meet with Ms. Willis any other time. Um, when you say meet with, what do you what do you mean meet with? Talk with her, meet with her. I mean, I would see Ms. Willis um, in passing if I'm walking through the through the office and something like that. Um, but no, I, I didn't have any meetings with Ms. Willis. Okay, so the only times you met with her were when you signed those contracts. Clarify meet with. I mean, I sat down and had a conversation. I signed these contracts, so when I signed these, I met with her 
to say that I sat down and spoke with Ms. Willis, um, are you saying in life and you saying during this time, what are you asking me? I mean, if it's voluminous, I can narrow down the times, but I didn't, I wasn't in the Merchant, I haven't really heard a point in a while. Can we get along to something yes. or we're going to yes. have to wrap it up? Um, so I had one more question about your text. Mm -hmm. um, have you ever been in an, any group text with anybody other than, with me and somebody other than Mr. Chopra and Mr. Merchant? You're going to have uh, to narrow that down. I'm sure you've sent many I texts. I can look at my phone. So with him, if there had been any other, any other texts. And I think the state had some him, things in rebuttal being, they mentioned, so I was just trying to clean that up before it got there. Can you try, try the question one more time? For yeah. Me. Isn't it true that you've the only texts that you and I have ever had have been between me and you, me, you, and Mr. Chopra, or me, you, and John Merchant, correct? Can I look at my phone? Sure. And what's the relevance of that, Ms. Merchant? They've said mul multiple times that there's this third party that we've talked to, and I'm trying to establish there's no third party. And I don't know why it was relevant, but the states argued it, so. Well, if, the, if Ms. Merchant doesn't know why it's relevant, then, then maybe it might okay. become relevant later, but right uh, now. Ms. Merchant, I, I think I've, you've been able to show okay. what what maybe launched this and, 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 and answer the, the state's initial Claims, and so let's get back to the core of what we were here for for this hearing. Do you have anything else relevant to ask this witness? After you, yes, just a few more questions. After you, um, after it became known that you were placed under subpoena, did you get a call from Gabe Banks? I did. And was he um, trying to determine if you were going to be giving information in this case? I can't, I, I don't know what he was trying to determine. Um, he stated that. Uh, it was an uh, odd, um, I had not um, spoken to Gabe in a while. Um, we are fr um, colleagues, we are friends, we are um, in the same fraternity, Gabe and I. And when he called, it was out of the blue, but he did call, yes ma'am. Okay, and you relayed that to me as well, correct? I did. And then um, you also got a call from your best friend um, who was relaying a message to you from Mr. Wade, correct? No, uh, I got a call saying that he got a call, not that a, a message that was supposed to be relayed to me. Um, the call was, um, I'm going to check if there's a hearsay, um, it, it, the response of the public hearsay. Thus far, it hasn't. But I'm sure. So, hearsay objection as to the contents of the call, Ms. Merchant. Um, I believe the contents of the call were to remember your privilege. I took that as a threat. I think Mr. Bradley took it as a threat, and I think he would testify to that. And he hasn't testified to it, and he also said there wasn't any message relayed by Mr. Wade or any party. Well, no, he didn't say it was by any party. Right. So, assuming he did hear something from a party, What's the uh, hearsay exception for that, Ms. Merchant? Um, I believe that it was a threat, so it's a statement against interest. Oh, I'm sorry, it's a, um, um, if, if he took it as a threat to influence his testimony, then it's not hearsay, then it would be impossible. All right, so. I did not take it as a threat. Uh, if you're saying it's a, to the effect on the listener, perhaps? Yes. Uh, then we'll go from there. Um, were you told to remember your privilege? Your Honor, uh, the witness just testified he didn't take it as a threat. Understood. Uh, it, I'll overrule the objection and the testimony given the weight it deserves. <laughs> Can you read the question? Were you told to remember your privilege? Your Honor, I was not. The witness, there, there may be a potential witness now in the courtroom because the person that Ms. Merchant is referring to is sitting in the courtroom. Well, if, she was, if that witness hasn't been told to testify, then I don't see any sequestration issues. I don't know who it is. I don't know his All name. Right. Okay. And so were you told anything to that effect, Mr. Bradley? Repeat the question one more time. But so I was not told, remember my privilege. Something about privilege, remembering that. I, I do recall... Um, privilege being 
um, mentioned, but it wasn't remember your privilege or, you know, a, a threat of, of any sort. But you immediately called me after? No, I called someone else after. You called me quickly thereafter then? I talked to you that day, yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Let's sit down. Because this is a defense witness, is it the state's cross, first cross? I think we, that's how we, how we have been doing it yesterday. No, actually, we're doing it just this way. Yeah, I've, I've been. Okay. This is I the first time that. he's gone, and then we go through all the defense, and then you'll have your chance. Some foundation questions to begin with, please. Your testimony as you began representing Mr. Wade as his attorney on what date or what approximate date? I didn't have a, an approximate date. Okay. And give me an approximate date when you began acting as Mr. Wade's attorney. Um, I would say it was, you know, if I'm, I'm speculating, I, I really don't want you to speculate. I mean, you're the one that was the attorney, and Mr. Wade was the client. Correct. So give us the ballpark figure of when it was that you began acting as his attorney. Maybe 2017, 2018, I think, maybe. And the purpose for which you were retained? His divorce. So, according to you, from that time period, your communications with Mr. Wade with regard to the divorce or any matters related to the divorce, it's your position or confidential, I'm sorry, our privilege, correct? Yes. The, for, yes. Okay, good. Now, did you ever meet with Ms. Willis and Mr. Wade prior to, and everything I'm asking you was prior to November of 20. 21, okay? Okay. Keep that in mind. That's... Why are you yelling? I don't think he's yelling, Mr. Bradley. He's just speaking up. All right, Mr. Sedow, let's go. Okay, thank you. Prior to Mr. Wade getting his um, contract with Fulton County, which was November 1st of 2021, okay? Just keep, please keep that in mind. November 1st of 2021. Right. Did you ever socialize with Mr. Wade and Ms. Willis prior to November 1st of 2021? I've never socialized with Mr. Wade or Ms. Willis in any setting. If you're asking, have I ever met with them then I would say yes, but when you say socialize, what do you mean socialize? Have you ever gone out to eat with both of them? Before 2021, I do not before think... November 1st of 2021. Out to eat with both of them before... When was she sworn in? I'm, I'm sorry. When was she sworn in? There was a dinner, there was a dinner before, she, I mean, when she was sworn in that I attended. Um, Shaquille O'Neal was there. So it was it was like her inauguration dinner. So I'm thinking that's before 2021. So I would say yes. Let's assume for purposes of my question. That yes, sir. In early January of 2021. Oh, that is early January 2021. Uh, then, uh, so yes, I mean, it would be before November. So if it was January, yes, that dinner would have been in, I'm assuming January. Okay. And any other time that you socialized, went out to eat, went to anyone's home, you know what socialized is. Exactly. So, no, I, I did not socialize with Mr. Willis. I mean, uh, with Miss Willis and Mr. Wade. So, prior to November 1st of 2021, did Miss Willis come to your offices? Your offices, I mean the offices that you shared with Mr. Wade. I think she came once or twice to our office, correct. And the purpose for which she came? I don't know. We had separate offices. Um, I do recall um, Who 
Well, let's, let's I, I do recall some type of meeting happening at our office, and I, I don't know what that was about. I wasn't a part of those meetings. Um, there was a meeting. There were other people there. Um, there were other people from the, I want to say DA's office there, maybe. Um, okay. Let's go back to the basics. Ms. Willis came to your offices, together offices, on a couple of different occasions. Correct? I recall Ms. Willis coming to my office at least twice. And on at least one of those occasions, or you tell us, did Ms. Willis meet privately with Mr. Wade in his office that you observed or heard? I can't recall. You can't recall? No. Did she ever meet with you in your office? Ms. Willis now. Privately in my office? No. I've never met privately in any office with her outside of signing this contract. Did Mr. Wade, prior to November 1st of 2021, ever talk to you about socializing with Ms. Willis? I can't recall. You can't recall? You're asking me if he, if he ever mentioned to me that he socialized. With Ms. Willis, correct. And I'm saying I cannot recall if he socialized with Ms. Willis, if he ever mentioned to me that he socialized. Did he ever mention to you that he ate or went out to dinner with Ms. Willis? Again, time period before November 1st of 2021. Did he, repeat your question. Mr. Wade ever tell you prior to November 1st of 2021 that he had socialized, gone out to eat, visited Miss uh, Willis in anything other than a professional setting? I'm sure he did, maybe. Um, I don't recall any specifics of any dinners, any um, specific places you're I mean it's been three years ago um, the time frame but I do not recall at this time whether or not he ever mentioned uh, any dinners or socializing did mr. Wade mentioned to you that he visited miss Willis at miss Willis's then current abode which would have been um, a, a place, not her original house, but a place she was staying in the period of uh, 2021 before November 1 of 2021. And his question is, did Mr. Wade ever tell you that he visited Miss Willis at her house? I don't think I can answer that. Yeah, the, the privilege uh, based on communication with my uh, Mr. Sid, if you want to try and rephrase the question, you can, but otherwise that would be sustained. On both grounds or just on the privilege ground? Just, uh, I didn't hear a second ground. Well, the hearsay ground. Oh, that, would, that would be on privilege alone. Did you talk to Mr. Wade at all about his relationship with Ms. Willis prior to November 1st of 2021? I think he's just laying a record, Mr. Wade. It's okay. Uh, and so on those same grounds, uh, Mr. Sid, on all subsequent grounds, Apparently, the relationship with Ms. Willis in any way is, a, uh, is covered by privilege, according to this witness. Well, I think the key words, respectfully, Your Honor, are according to this witness. So I'm trying to drill down to see if there are communications that are not within the privilege. Sure. I, I can. So then we need to acknowledge the privilege in the form of your question, right? You, are you asking me to ask it as in a way of saying, are, are there any non privilege? Essentially. Okay. <clears throat> Did you ever communicate with Mr. Wade prior to November 1st of 2021 about Ms. Willis that was not privileged? I mean, we discussed this contract. Um, 
But this contract doesn't help. You have to give me a, a, a um, pivot number, please. You said before November 2021. Yeah, November first of 2021. Before November, this this contract for 125.21 is before that. So I mean, we discussed this contract. Okay. Um, and if I remember this, correctly, that, what again? Just give me that exhibit number so we can reference uh, it. Exhibit 23. Okay. Just hold on been. one second. One second. On Exhibit 23, did I understand you to say that it was Mr. Wade that effect brought to you and Ms. Willis together for the contract? That would be accurate, yes. Okay. And, and what did you understand was a relationship at that point between Ms. Willis and Mr. Wade for Mr. Wade to be able to bring you to Ms. Willis for the contract? It's not a hard question. It's no, I'm, really I'm just uh, – state that again. Mr. Wade is the one that basically says mm -hmm. to you, go see Ms. Willis about this contract, right? Mm -hmm. That's a yes, correct? Yeah. Mr. Yes. So Mr. I'm, Wade I'm, I'm, had to have some knowledge, you would assume. Yes. Right? That you going to Ms. Willis might bring you the contract. I right? never went to Ms. Willis. So I, I stated I never went to Miss Willis. No. I was told about the that there was a potential contract, and that I was asked by Mr. Wade if I would be interested in doing that contract. Okay, I question, never. Okay, my question to you is, what was the basis that you understood Mr. Wade being able to potentially <coughs> offer you that contract for Miss on Miss Willis's behalf? I'm not objecting to that. That's a mischaracterization. Mr. Wade offered it to him. I think he said he expressed interest. And also, I, I don't see the, um, the relevance of, of this at all. Um, so just in terms of relevance or phrasing, I'll, I'll overrule on those grounds. So the question that's standing unobjected to, Mr. Bradley. Can you repeat the question? You've explained to us how the contract yes. came to you, correct? Yes. I, my question is, what was your understanding of the relationship of Mr. Wade and Ms. Willis for it to have been offered or whatever word you want to use for him to have said, um, expressed to you whether you had an interest in the contract? Privilege. All right. Mr. Evans is no privilege on that question. So, Mr. Sayal, I think you need to clarify whether... Was it a privileged conversation that you had with Mr. Wade that let you know about the contract? Or, you know, it was the relationship was the question you're focused on. Is the nature... No. I'm trying to do it in such a way, and I understand what the court said. Was the relationship that I asked you about just now between Mr. Wade and Ms. Willis that gave rise to the contract, did you know about that relationship as a result of an attorney-client communication? No. I knew of that um, through whatever work they did together um, as municipal court judges. Um, that's and how did you know that? Who told you about the work that they did together as municipal court judges? Mr. Wade told me that they um, did work at, the, at some conference. Okay, now this would have been something that Mr. Wade said, according to your time period, at the time that you were representing Mr. Wade, correct? Say that again? Ask that again? Mr. Wade would have told you what you just told the court after you had established an attorney-client relationship with Mr. Wade, correct? Yes, but he, the, when he told me of them being at a conference, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not understanding how, how I relate. I mean, I'm trying to understand your question. Well, my question is basically, you had communications with Mr. Wade directly that yes. were not attorney-client privilege, right? I've had conversations with Mr. Wade that were not attorney-client privilege, yes. That involved Ms. Willis, correct? I just stated that they were at a conference. I don't know it, whether or not that involved her or not. Well, if he's talking about her, that is, 
if Mr. Wade is telling you about Ms. Willis and Mr. Wade having met at a conference, right, then he's talking about Ms. Willis, correct? Yes, but he also told me about other people that he met at the conference. But he told you about Ms. Willis as well, correct? Um, I, I think so, yes. Okay. So there were communications in which Ms. Willis was at least a topic that was not covered by attorney-client privilege, correct? This particular instance, I was told about a conference. And, and you, when were you told this? I can't remember uh, the dates um, of the conference, but it was after, it would have been after the conference. Okay, well, I'm trying to get this is the time period here. After the conference, I want you to understand from the record, I believe we've shown that the conference was sometime in October of 2019. Okay. So could you give us an idea, that being uh, a fact, when you would have had this communication about meeting with Ms. Willis at the conference, that is Mr. Wade meeting Ms. Willis at the conference? Um, if the if that's the conference that they were at, yes, then you know I don't know how many um, municipal court conferences there are. Um, I do know that at the time that I was in the firm, Mr. Wade was um, he had some position with the municipal court. Yeah, um, right now, my only question is time wise. Assuming it's October of 2019, mm -hmm. when do you tend to remember? What's your best recollection? of when Mr. Way told you about. I, I can't remember because I didn't even remember that it was October 2019 until you said that. Okay. So you don't have a present recollection? I, I do not remember that, no. Had to be before the contract, though, in January of 2021, correct? That they met? No, no, that you were told about Mr. Wade and Ms. Willis meeting at the conference had to be before. Oh, yeah, uh, yes, it would, be, it would have been before that, yes. So what other communications did you have with Mr. Wade about Ms. Willis that are not privileged? We know of one, about the meeting at the conference. Are you suggesting that that's the only one you ever had about Ms. Willis that isn't? I cannot recall any, I cannot recall. You cannot recall whether there were any other communications that weren't privileged? No. I'll be specific, and, and I understand there's probably going to be objections, but I want the record to reflect. Did you have a conversation with Mr. Wade prior to November 1st of 2021 about Mr. Wade dating Ms. Willis? Um, uh, Mr. Wade has risen. Uh, an objection is sustained to the record. Excuse me, Mr. Evans. <coughs> Say that again. Uh, you don't have to answer the question, Mr. Oh. Brown. The next question is Say that. <coughs> well, I understand it's been objected to in the court. Is uh, sustain the objection. Can you tell us um, the circumstances in which, that is, under which Mr. Wade may have told you about dating? What I want to do is try to figure out if we can, you tell me if you want me, if I can do this. I'd like to know how the communications themselves took place, where they took place, how they took place, under what circumstance, whether he was at the time providing advice or seeking advice. Mm -hmm. So, those are the basics. If I can ask you as to all those, but sure. if the court's going to sustain the objection to those, then I don't want to waste your time. And that's something I'll cover in camera. So I'll, I'll note uh, the question on the um, your uh, your question for the record, and I'll, I'll sustain the privilege objection to that. Okay. Okay. All of this prior to November first, twenty twenty one. Okay. Uh, I'm going to show you two text messages. Okay, so uh, I'm going to have objections. Of course, 
David have objections? I realize that. I want to be able to show it to him, and then I'm going to frame. We're going to frame the appropriate question, and then you're going to object. It. We'll see where we are. Oh, uh, you may, sir. Then you must be a seasayer. Uh, Mr. Bradley, I showed you two text messages, correct? Both of those text messages occurred on January the 5th of 2024 at approximately 11.56 a.m. Am I correct? Um, I think so. Yes. Okay. And the text messages would have been between you and Ms. Merchant, correct? I uh, didn't see it. it. Yes, it should be. Okay. And I've shown the same two to uh, prosecution, so we're talking about the same two. In the text message to Ms. Merchant, you indicated knowledge of some activity on the part of Mr. Wade, correct? I haven't asked him anything about what the... Flag for the court. This is a topic and a specific exchange that Ms. Merchant went into, and there were objections that were sustained. All right, understood. Yes. And it's your testimony that the information that you imparted to Miss Merchant in these two text messages is based entirely on confidential communications between you and Mr. Wade, correct? Objection. He's referencing specific knowledge. The specific knowledge comes from Mr. Wade, which is regarding establishing. One other question. He didn't get into anything. He just said, are these two text messages about privileged communications? We haven't actually. He's test, he, I don't see an issue there. Yes. Really. And is it your testimony that the knowledge that you have, which you imparted in these two text messages, came from Mr. Wade and Mr. Wade alone? Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Can you tell us when it was that Mr. Wade imparted this information to you? Objection. All right. And I, I think that, that's, one of what, that's what you're going to do. In, sure. So I'll sustain that on privilege. And I'm going to introduce for the record when we finish these two text messages so that Your Honor has those back there so that you can. Sure. What would they be marked as? Um, what do you have? I think that. Okay. Let's see. I'm going to go ahead. Oh, Once I put a staple in it, I think it'll be 20, Defense Exhibit 26. All right, so this is marked and made part of the record as Defense Exhibit 26, but not necessarily for its. This is not a fiduciary value. This is for purposes of the court conducting the in-camera review. Right. And put a staple in it here to make sure that it's here. All right, Ms. Sedow, what else? All right, so there was also reference, if I remember correctly, to some email correspondence in which Ms. Merchant sent you the motion that she was going to file to disqualify um, Ms. Willis and Mr. Wade for your review. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. 
And that was sent to you in an email? That was correct. And did you respond to it in an email? I don't think I responded to her in an email. Ashley, do we know? You responded by text. I'm sorry, I mischaracterized it. You responded in t by text? Um, if I can look at my text, I can. But it, I'm assuming I did, but. Okay, um, I'm going to get it for you because okay. I don't want there right. to be any assumption. Let me show you. This is. I'm going to show you if, if I might approach. I made reference to an email that Ms. Merchant would have sent you about the uh, motion she was going to file. If you look at this, does this appear to be the email that you received? It's dated January the 6th, 2024 at 10 or 6, 10 25 a.m. Yeah, I, I see it at the email, yes. So that's the email that you received. <coughs> Along with the, uh, obviously the attachment, which is right. Yes. Okay. And then, did you respond to that email within the text message that I've just placed before you? Yes, I said it looks good. So the, the answer is yes. Oh, yes, I did. Okay. And okay, we'll mark this as another exhibit for your honor to look at. Okay, I'm going to have these marked as, as 27. Okay? All right, so is it your position that what is reflected, let me hand it to you. Yeah. What's the court's rule for asking about the uh, We'll take it case by case. I think he's doing all right, so no need to ask for this witness. Is it your uh, position that your response, which is the second page of Defense Exhibit 27, is based on a confidential or confidential communications that you had with Mr. Wade. Do you want me to read the response? No, no, I'm only asking you whether or not the response, you actually already said what it said. You, you, I don't want you to read it again. Is that response, excuse me, based on confidential communications that you had had with Mr. Wade? Objection, this is privilege and cumulative. All right, so now we're talking about the email, essentially referencing the motion as a whole. He hasn't been asked to actually confirm or deny any specifics, just to say whether his response is privileged. So I think we're just laying the foundation, just like we did with the text message. So you can answer that question, sir. Was my response privilege? No. Was your response to the email of Ms. Merchant, which is on page one? Mm -hmm. Is your response, which is on page two, is that based on knowledge that you received from Mr. Wade pursuant to confidential communications? Yes. Have you discussed with the district attorney's office um, this case, or your purported testimony? Of my testimony? Yes. No. At all? No. No prep, no conversations, no nothing? <clears throat> no. Have you given your attorneys, for this matter, um, 
Did you give him permission to speak with the district attorney's uh, office? Uh, well, he can assert his own privilege, but uh, that's kind of crazy. Uh, is there a objection to be heard? Absolutely. This is okay. Sustained. sustained. Say that. Next question. Do you know whether or not your attorney shared confident, excuse me, privileged information with the district attorney's office? No, I, I don't know what my attorney shared or didn't share. I don't know if they even met. <clears throat> Have you, last question, have you spoken to Mr. Wade prior to today? No, actually, what's wrong? Uh, you're no longer in the same partnership or fee-sharing arrangement with Mr. Wade, correct? That's correct. Uh, when did you leave that fee-sharing partnership, pseudo-partnership arrangement? Um, I don't remember the hard date, but maybe sometime like July, August of 2022, I think. Okay. And what was the reason for the partnership or the fee-sharing arrangements? What, what caused the separation? I wanted to leave and go out on my own. And that's the only reason? I wanted to leave and go out on my own, yes. I understand, but that's, that was the only reason. There wasn't any suggestions or allegations of any form of misconduct on either part, either on your part or Mr. Wade's part, correct? Misconduct of what? I don't want to try not to get into specifics. Is there any allegations made of suspected misconduct on your part or on Mr. Wade's part? That's a fairly simple question. Did he accuse you of doing anything? Did you accuse him of doing anything? Without getting into what it is, were there any accusations made by you or him against each other? We had a disagreement, yes. And had that disagreement have anything to do with Ms. Willis? Oh, no. Okay. Did it have anything to do with your conduct? No. Did it have what? anything to do with his conduct? Hold on, wait. So we had a disagreement whether the disagreement was we disagreed and so we dissolved for well i left the firm and, and was the disagreement having anything to do with alleged or supposed misconduct by either one of you i don't if you define misconduct i'm telling you we had a disagreement and we but just tell me what the disagreement was then. the disagreement is mine to know. I mean, I don't see the relevance of the disagreement that I had. It had nothing to do with this Trump case or any other case. I'm simply getting a, a question asked. What was the disagreement? It's not privileged, correct? No, that is privileged. Oh, it is privileged. It Why is. is that privileged? Because it's privileged. I can tell the court in, in camera, but it was privileged. Ask a few questions further to see if this is actually something that does fall within that privilege. We can were, take it from there. Were you, did it have anything to do with you representing Mr. Wade in any capacity? Excuse me. It, it would fall in that line, yes. And, but your, your testimony is that it has nothing to do with your representation of Mr. Wade in connection with Ms. Willis. As it a connection to Ms. Willis, that's correct. Connected to, um, the matter for which you were hired by Mr. Wade? I wasn't hired by Mr. Wade. I thought you were the attorney representing him in the divorce. Oh, I, I apologize. I thought you were saying something else. Oh, yes. So will it apply as to um, whether I was hired during the divorce? Yes, that's correct. I'm, I'm not sure what, what, what this correct means under that. You kind of got lost on it. We asked the question. It did not relate to your representation. It did relate marriage, to my representation. In the marriage case. It does. Um, and this was a, wh whose decision was, at that point, did you stop representing Mr. Wade? It wasn't at that point, no. Was it before that? No, it was after that. Okay. And how much longer did you represent Mr. Wade in the divorce action? I would have to <clears throat> see the uh, divorce proceeding to see uh, Mr. Wade um, 
I represented Mr. Wade for a time after that. He represented me in a construction case um, for a time after that. He um, and I will have to look at the the filings. I ended up hiring a new counsel for my construction case. He ended up, but it wasn't right at that moment. It wasn't in a matter of weeks. It was. I don't know. You continued representing him in connection with the um, divorce case after you had the separation that you've made reference And he continued to, yes, and he continued to represent me on a construction case. But the separation, at least in part, if I heard you correctly, and please tell me if I'm wrong, had something to do with your representation of him in the um, divorce case. That is correct. Okay. Now. Mr. Wade has testified that he did not have a relationship, a personal relationship, a romantic relationship with Ms. Willis until sometime early 2022, okay? I'm leaving that as, as the premise for what I'm about to ask you. Do you possess information that counters that, that's inconsistent with that? Any information Mr. Bradley has would be privileged, Your Honor. Okay, Mr. Seda, I think we... Would such information be privileged? In your mind? Uh, I think this has already been asked uh, during Ms. Merchant's direct, so we're covering the same ground. <coughs> I'll sustain that. So I can't get an answer to whether he possesses information which is inconsistent no, without we, getting into the in, information itself. I think the issue would be that we've already gotten an answer on that, and now we're asking the same question again. Ms. Merchant asked him variation of that and he already answered. I think the variation your honor is referencing whether or not he had what would be personal information, independent source information. Mine is not so limited. Mine is, I'm asking in point blank whether or not he has information from whatever source, including Mr. Wade, that is inconsistent with Mr. Wade's testimony. Because if it includes Mr. Wade, it is privileged communication. So therefore the answer is it's privileged. If it excluded Mr. Wade, that would be a different appropriate question. Okay. And, and I just want to say, the, the answer is either it came from privileged information or it's hearsay. That's it. He's already testified that he had no personal knowledge. <coughs> Unless it's for impeachment at this point. But, um, Mr. Seda, I think that might be too fine a distinction for me to be the, the need for the question. I, I, I'm, I think I'm failing to see the difference. Well, I, I'm, I'm not asking respectfully, I'm not asking you to see the difference. I'm asking whether I can ask that question and elicit a response which doesn't elicit the actual communications, which is what I'm attempting okay. to do. And, and if and Your Honor says I can't, then I'm finished. And, if, I, think, and I think that we, we this, this was another aspect of what came up before, which is, in, in my mind, even confirming the existence of the information goes into... Uh, privileged communications, whether he does or does not possess information, if it came from that relationship, that's part of the privilege as well. So if, if I make that clear, then, um, then so I'd you're be sustaining what the objection would be. That's right. It'd be right. sustained on privilege. And of question. course, all the questions that we're Reserve talking for the about as far as the foundation about when things are said and what is said, you're going to go into, if I understood correctly, ex parte in camera with the two exhibits we've talked about. That's right. My intent would be to uh, make a record of the knowledge of when it was attained and the extent of it and the different sources, and that'll be sealed. And, and, what, and what was actually said? That's right. So I guess my question to the court before I sit down is if, if, hypothetically, you learn through this in-camera ex parte um, examination that the information that this gentleman has through the um, attorney client privilege is in fact inconsistent with what Mr. Wade testified to under oath. Then the court is going to then make a determination of whether it can be used here or whether it just remains in the record sealed. So my intent would be to make the distinction of from the in-camera hearing, if I still determine that everything is covered by privilege, then anything else that is said cannot go into the factual determinations or credible determinations that need to be made. And so just the average, the issue of whether the privilege did or did not exist is preserved. Okay. So, again, just to follow through to make sure, 
So if the court knows that there's been a fraud upon the court through the lie of Mr. Wade, none of us are going to know that that in fact occurred and the court's going to be in a position of making a determination on the motion, even though the court knows that it doesn't have all the information, truthful information. I'll take a look, a closer look at the case law you provided to see if that is actually a variation of the crime fraud exception. Um, and I'll apply the crime fraud exception as I, as I see it. Right. And, and again, it's, I'm not suggesting it is a, a variation. It is totally separate from crime fraud. It has nothing to do okay. with using the legal advice of the attorney in order to commit a, a crime. It's you go ahead and commit fraud or lie to the court when you full, fully know that someone, your attorney, has information which is counter or inconsistent with what you've testified to. And to that end, Mr. Sadout, that is something that you can, I mean, I've got this case from Ohio, uh, but if you can find something more on point in Georgia before we schedule Other this Other than the one I gave you. The Coca-Cola one? The 1935 case. The Atlanta <laughs> Bottling Company? I don't, think, I don't think it went that far. I think it just kind of said the sword and shield language, and it didn't go so far as to say that there's this alternative theory about fraud upon the court. But we can flush that out in our research. I appreciate it. Thank okay. you. Mr. Stockton. No question. Mr. Durham. No question, John. Mr. McDougal. No question, John. Mr. Rice. Mr. Bradley, you were counsel for Mr. Wade in the divorce case when the interrogatories were initially served on opposing counsel on on or about December 27th of 2021, correct? That's correct. And you were also counsel on him for him when the amended interrogatories were served on May 30th of 2023, correct? That's incorrect. So you ceased representing him sometime before May 30th of 2023? That's correct. At any point during the divorce proceedings, was a pleading filed with the court or a paper served on opposing counsel that purported to have your signature that you were not the one that signed or authorized your signature on? Say that again? Did anyone sign your signature without your authorization on any pleading or any other paperwork served on opposing counsel in the divorce proceeding? I don't think so. Um, if you have the documents, I can authenticate my signature um, and you have testified that you also practice criminal law and divorce law and perhaps other types of law as well that's correct and are you aware that OCG 16-6-19 uh, defines adultery as a misdemeanor crime in the state of Georgia if you say so yes sir go ahead okay. judge I would ask the court to take judicial notice of that for what relevance? Uh, Judge, I think it does go directly to the crime fraud exception. Um, because if, before we draw objection, because if Mr. Wade was providing information to him, to his counsel about his intent to either commit adultery or that he was committing adultery, then that would be a misdemeanor crime. It would implicate the crime fraud exception. And additionally, um, as we know from yesterday's evidence. Let me pause you there. Isn't adultery, as a statute, just on its face, been found unconstitutional? You it can't is, actually charge anyone with adultery it anymore? Is, it is still current in then the Then it state. can't be a crime. It is still a current charge. Let's move on to that next argument. Um, additionally, Judge, with regard to the interrogatories, we have three different sets of interrogatories that were filed that came into evidence yesterday, 21, May of 23, December of 23, that contain false information. Um, we also have the January of 24 that contains the invocation of privilege. So to the extent that this witness has information, both with the original interrogatories that were filed in December of 2021, and frankly with regard to the later ones, even though he wasn't counsel, um, that would be a false swearing and fraud on the court, which again is a criminal offense, um, and therefore the crime fraud exception would apply as well. Okay. Um Understood. No further questions. 
Okay, Mr. Gillen. Good afternoon, Ms. Bradley. Good afternoon. It's been a long day. <clears throat> uh, when did you sign your engagement letter with Mr. Wade to represent him in divorce proceedings? It would have to be 2017, 2018, um, same time frame, 2017, 2018. So did you sign or have signed an engagement letter uh, to represent him or are you just speculating? I can't recall. Um, I mean, we were in a... You know, we shared space. Um, I can't recall if um, if there was a contract or if there is a contract. I haven't. I, I think there is a contract, um, but right now it would be speculation. Right now, sitting here, mm -hmm. you do not know whether or not you had a signed engagement letter with Mr. Ray, Wade discussing the parameters of your legal representation of him. Isn't that correct? That's not correct. I mean, I, I, I can't say. I, can, I don't have my files or anything with me. Well, sitting here, you do not have specific recollection or knowledge that you even had an engagement letter to represent him. Isn't that right? I think I had an engagement letter, but I do not know specifically if I had an engagement letter. Well, when did you open a file? Did you open the, you when you represent someone? You open a file in your office, uh, and when did you open the file on uh, on Mr. Wade? Uh, I am going to object to the relevance of this line of questioning. There has been no dispute by the the attorney or the client that there was an attorney-client relationship, and so I, I object to the relevance of um, the circumstances under which that that uh, engagement began. Because as Mr. Gillen knows, that's not a factor in whether there was a uh, true attorney-client. Well, Your Honor, it's not just up to Mr. Wade and Mr. Bradley. It's up to the court. I, I agree with you there, Mr. Gillen, and so I'll give you a, a, a little bit of leeway, but I don't think we could spend too much time on this. No, so uh, okay, we'll see. Uh, Your Honor. Now, did you or did you not open a file in your law practice with Mr. Wade's name on it, yes or no? Yes, I had a file with Mr. Wade's name on it. When did you open that file? I'm assuming 2017, 2018. I I can't tell you the exact date. I've said that three or four times. Well, let's approach it from another angle. When is the first invoice that you sent to Mr. Uh, Wade uh, in, uh, for your rep legal representation? I didn't send him an invoice um, in that capacity. So what we have here is we have you're not knowing whether you even have an engagement letter you don't know whether you actually even billed him, correct? I represented Mr. Wade. I signed the documents that we filed. I filed the documents. I, there's depositions that I had um, with the um, divorce attorney that was representing his wife. I'm sorry, sir. That's not my question. Okay. My question is... <clears throat> Did you bill him in your capacity as the lawyer that you're telling him? I don't him? recall. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, is there? did you have any invoices where you billed him on an hourly basis? I don't recall. And the answer really is no, isn't it, sir? I don't recall. And the reason why it's no, isn't it, is because what happened is that you and Mr. Wade were in a law practice together, and it was a very small uh, work environment, correct? It was a work environment, yes. A work environment when you, where you and, and him would uh, meet and talk literally every day, correct? Not every day, no. Well, almost every day. When you Not almost every day. I, I, I stated earlier that I ran one side of a practice. Um, Mr. Wade did, and we rarely were there at the same time. I stated that earlier today. So, well, we, well just give us totally how much money you got uh, for representing Mr. Wade uh, in this since... 2017 or whenever you told us up until uh, you dropped off the case in uh, 2023 I don't recall 
Would the answer be zero? I do not recall. Well, you would know whether he got paid or not, wouldn't you, sir? I do not recall. So you don't recall whether you as an attorney got a single dollar to represent Mr. Wade, correct? That's correct. Because you really did it as a friend, didn't you? No, I did it as an attorney. Well, an attorney that wasn't being paid. You were doing it pro bono for a friend, weren't yeah, you? I'm going to have to ask me if All right. So I'm going to sustain that, Mr. Gillen. I think the law is clear that money doesn't even have to change hands for that relationship. I'm, I'm making a finding based on the evidence that's already been presented, mainly the fact that he signed pleadings, attended depositions on Mr. Wade's behalf, that uh, attorney-client relationship did exist well, at some okay, point. I was ex just uh, laying the foundation to the circumstances in terms of the, you know, the, the, the non-billing from the 2017 period and whether there was really an attorney-client privilege there. That's what I was trying to do. Okay. Uh, if, you, if, you, if, you, if the dispute is just when it occurred, you can try to hone in on that, but the questions I've heard so far are more from a you were never paid ever, you, you know, from an oh. overall angle. Well, from 2017 until November uh, uh, of 2021, you didn't receive a dollar from Mr. Wade for your uh, supposed or your representation of him, correct? I don't have the file in front of me, and I do not recall. Okay. And the reality of it is, as I mentioned or asked you a few minutes ago, is that it was a small firm, and you were doing him as essentially a favor as a friend and as a law partner, correct? No, I was representing him as an attorney. Um, were we in the practice together? Yes. And were we, or are we friends? I mean, we were friends at the time, yes. Well, you were friends and law partners, correct? Yes. And in, in, in a small firm, and I know, because I'm with, in a small firm, uh, people will sit around the office and talk about their social life and what they're doing, correct? Correct. If that happens in your small firm, yes, yes. Well, that doesn't happen, or did it happen in your small firm? Again, I'm going to, um, the, list, the witness has been asked very specific questions about conversations about socialization, and we've gone on through it, so I think this is asking it. All right, I'll let him answer this one question overruled. Repeat the question. Oh. Did you, in your small firm, have occasion to where people would sit around and socialize and talk about what was going on in their lives? as opposed to merely talking about the law. Yes. And you had those conversations with Mr. Wade uh, as a friend on a social basis, didn't you? I assume we... Not yet, but it might. I assume, yes, we talked about sports. We talked about, you know, uh, sports a whole lot. He talked about life and about what was going on in your life and what was going on in his life, right? Right? Sometimes, very rarely, yes, sometimes. And, and that is what you do in a small work environment when you know people very well and you do favors for them, correct? Yeah. All right. Um, so, saying next question, Mr. Gillen. Now, in that capacity, did you, didn't you have discussions with Mr. Wade about what was going on in his social life? that had nothing to do with him asking you legal advice? Objection to be more specific. Uh, I think he's just asked whether he socializes outside of legal advice. So uh, I think he can answer that question. I did answer the question. I said we talked about sports a lot. And I'm asking, you know, sports is one thing. The social life, uh, did you talk about each other's social life like Mr. Wade and who he was dating? All right. So that'll be sustained on privilege. Yeah, Your Honor, just for the record, I would state that that my objection would be that that uh, the privilege only uh, uh, protects communications in, in furtherance of seeking out illegal advice, not talking about something that might be personal or confidential. And that's the that's okay. the distinction that I would draw. I, th I think that's a, a, a accurate legal point. Uh, however, I think the witness has already been questioned and testified on this point. Thank so you. next question. Now, uh, you, uh, you you got into the fact that you were the initial attorney on the on the divorce case, correct? That is correct. Now, uh, did you and Mr. Wade, without getting into discussion, did you and Mr. Wade uh, together prepare his re responses to the interrogatories which were filed uh, initially in the divorce case? 
I'm assuming we. Objection. He's asking about interrogatory responses, preparation of the case in the divorce case. I mean, that's that's all covered under attorney-client law. Mr. Gill, well, I don't think it's attorney-client. Did they meet together? And and when when the interrogatory answers were filed, did he file them? And did he do that in concert with his with his client? There's nothing, there's nothing privileged there. Did they meet and work together? And that work uh, taking the form of them talking back and forth to each other on the right responses? I'll change it a little bit. Um, did you review yourself uh, the interrogatory responses given in the divorce case? I did. And whatever knowledge that you had when you were involved in the interrogatory responses, you had the knowledge of all that material or information that you had had without getting into the content. Objection. You had Objection. all of that knowledge question. and information. I'm sorry, I was, let me get my question out That's before I was trying to he say. objects. Uh, and when you filed those interrogatories, you had all the knowledge and information that you would obtain from Mr. Wade from 2017 up until the date the interrogatories were filed, didn't you, sir? Okay, so that's uh, it, 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 the follow-up question to that is going to be incorporating knowledge learned during communication. So I'll I'll, no, I'm not going to have a follow-up question. I just want to know whether whether you know, is that is that the case? When he filed the interrogatory forms, he had all of the information that he had uh, discussed with Mr. Wade from 2017 up until the time. That's it. That's my final question. Okay. In, in which case, without doing that extra assuming link that he based his answers on those communications, it has no relevance. Well, uh, it, it does in the sense that it shows what knowledge he may have had when he, the attorney, is filing interrogatory responses. That's what it shows. Okay. I wouldn't, I, I'm still not seeing the relevance of his knowledge as the attorney filing the responses, unless you're linking this back to well, Mr. It, it, you know, it, it gets back, Your Honor, to whether or not, uh, if you're filing, if you're an attorney and you're filing an interrogatory response, which you have reason to believe, or specific information to know that certain responses uh, are not accurate, then you shouldn't be filing them. And now, uh, so that, that's where I was going with that. So if... If he's got a body of knowledge over here that's built up from his communications with Mr. Wade that everyone so dearly doesn't want uh, everyone to know about, in spite of the uh, the allegations made against Miss Merchant, now. Okay. So, what if the question was, did you uh, did you when you signed your name to the interrogatories, um, did you commit any knowing? fraudulent statement and submitting those to the court at the time. Would there be a problem with that statement or that question? Well, I mean, I think that is a conclusion that others could draw, like the court. I just want to know that he had all that information at the time that he, as the attorney, filed the interrogatories. That's it. We would, we would object. Uh, this does fall under attorney-client, and he's making presumptions about when information may have or not have been disseminated. <coughs> To Mr. Bradley in his capacity as attorney. He didn't have to know about anything at the time of, in the middle of, at the end of, or he may never have had that information. There's too much presumption associated with it. The whole matter is covered under privilege. One, one comment on that, Your Honor. We have spent almost a day talking about trying to block public dis uh, the uh, dissemination of what Mr. Wade said either as an attorney or in any capacity about his relationship with Ms. Willis prior to November the 1st, 2021. And questions about uh, discussions in, uh, in 2019, all objected to uh, the, the, the claiming the privilege. And now to say, well, that doesn't mean that he learned something after. I'm talking about what did you know at the time the interrogatories were filed? And everything that you, they're, now they're claiming privilege, well, that's fine. The court will address that uh, in, in chamber and in due course. What okay. did you know? I'm sorry, Mr. Gillen, I really don't see the distinction. So uh, your, your question's noted for the record and your objection as well. All right, and, uh, and, and I'll follow up with this. Uh, now, you're leaving uh, the, the uh, removing yourself from the, the case, the divorce case, correct? You, you withdrew from the divorce case, correct? Correct. Did you do that as a result of your concern about any of the accuracies or representations which had been made by your client in the divorce case? 
No. Um, okay, so that's going to cover communications during the relationship? Well, Your Honor, hypothetically, not saying this is the case, hypothetically, if uh, Mr. Bradley, uh, knowing, let's say hypothetically, that he, 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 speaking with Mr. Wade, was aware that the, that the intimate uh, or personal relationship, romantic relationship, existed prior to November the 1st, 2021, and started uh, in 2019 or 2020, if he's armed with that information that he's obtained from Mr. Wade, but Mr. Wade uh, would want to insist on responding to interrogatories which were contrary to the information that Mr. Bradley would have, then I'm asking him whether he took steps as an attorney to say, I cannot uh, be a part of that or countenance that, therefore I'm withdrawing from the case. Sure. Um, I still see that as covering their communications. So I'll sustain that objection. All right. Well, thank you, Your Honor. That's all I have. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Gill. Thank you. Mr. Kachur, are you still with us? Anyone on behalf of Mr. Floyd still joining us? All right, moving on. Mr. Cromwell. Just two brief questions, Your Honor. I think we've been, everybody's exhausted with this line of question. Right? How's it going, Mr. Bradley? Um, when did you withdraw from Mr. Wade's divorce case? I don't have it in front of me. Um, can, I don't have the file. Can, was it sometime in... 2023? No, it would have probably been, well, 2023. Um, see, I left in 2022. Um, it could have been anywhere between um, July of 2022 and maybe December of, it, it wasn't, I, I don't have the accurate date, but it wasn't when I left and it wasn't. Make it easier. Okay. All right. You were not his divorce lawyer at the time. The interrogatory responses were filed in May of 2023. Is that correct? Oh, no, I was not. Okay. Yes. And as of today's date, Mr. Wade is still a married man. Would you agree? I haven't kept up with the divorce uh, proceedings, but I, I think they're still open. So, and if they're still open, that means he's still a married man. Yes, that's correct. So if the, the fact that in a pleading there is a re reference to the marriage is irretrievably broken, that doesn't mean the marriage ends, does it? Well, I guess you have to ask the judge to sign the case. Well, it, it doesn't end until there's actually a, a divorce decree signed by a judge. Would you agree? I, I would agree. All right. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Cross, were you taking... I am, Your Honor, and I'm going to have a minute. Um, my cross-examination might be a long, a, a long, long one. Um, so we can go for an hour and a half. Do I have just a five-minute break? Sure. All right. We'll be back in five.
Okay, we're back on the record, and oh, and then maybe no, we're not. We can get Mr. Bradley back. While he's coming out, Ms. Merchant, for planning purposes, based on uh, Mr. Bradley's testimony, was presented. Do you anticipate calling any further witnesses? Ms. Cross. Thank you, Mr. Bradley, have you still got the exhibits 23, 24, 25 there in front of you? I do. And 23, that's one of the contracts for that with your your personal LLC or PC, your personal legal entity, right? For the that is correct. Attorney's office? Yes? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And I understood your testimony to be that any income that came into the partnership, when I say partnership, let's, let me be more specific. You had an individual legal entity. Mr. Campbell had an individual legal entity. Mr. Wade had an individual legal entity. But y'all had a partnership agreement, right? Yes, but we didn't have that um, the entire time. There was yes. a period of time that we've been talking through that we had talked about in 2022 prior to leaving the firm that there was an actual entity for the three of you, correct? That is correct. And that was roughly during the time period where you all brought some bought a building together. Yes, correct. And it made things simpler for whatever reason you decided at that time that a joint entity made sense to own that, that building, right? Correct. Okay. All right, but those contracts there, they're not with the joint entity, correct? No, they're not. Those are all with you individually, is that right? Can you take a look at 23, 24, and 25? Yes. They're all with you individually? Yes. Okay. 23, what's the hourly rate that you were being compensated? Um, 23 is the, um, I don't think, no, 23 is not the first appearance. 23 is um, the taint, it says. What's the hourly rate on that contract? Um, 150 an hour. 150 an hour? All right. So the 150 an hour, <clears throat> the way I understand you all shared profits was you get 50, Mr. Campbell get 50, Mr. Wade get 50, and then y'all pay expenses uh, jointly as well, correct? Correct. All right. What about exhibit number 24? It seems to be the, the same. Same amount? Um, I don't know if it's the same amount. Um, I'm interested in the amount. Oh, the no, uh, the amount was um, 65 an hour. $65 an hour? Mm -hmm. All right. That's not a um, particularly high rate for an attorney in the Atlanta metro area, correct? Uh, no, it's not. Right. Was that a government rate that you were willing to accept at that time? Um, yes, that is correct. All right. And so the $60 you're getting... For that contract, again, that split three ways, you, Mr. Wade, and Mr. Campbell, correct? That is correct. So when you were Minus asking, expenses and stuff like that. Exactly, yes. exactly. That was the income and then expenses come from that and then profits, whatever's at the end, correct? Correct. All right. So when you were being asked questions about Mr. Wade, I think the, the phrasing, and I object to, but I, I think um, you might recall the question, the... Mr. Wade brought you this contract, or Mr. Wade got you this contract. Do you remember those questions? Uh, yes, I do. All right. So we're talking then about a split among the three of you of, of, of about $20 a piece, right, for that particular contract? For this one, yes. All right. What about 24? You got 24? That, I'm sorry, 25. Have you got that in front of you? I do. What's the hourly rate on that one? It's 150 150 on that one, too? All right. In this same sharing went through the business the way you handled that contract in, as well, right? That's correct. All right. Who is Austin Dabney? Um, he was a probation officer that um, passed the bar, and we hired him 
and another individual I can't he the other person didn't stay long and did Mr. Dabney and the other um, legal associates that you all had working for you at that time did they do some work on these first appearance contracts yes uh, and that was a pretty good position for a younger lawyer to be sent to get some courtroom experience correct that is correct <laughs> Two thousand and twenty. Uh, you're aware that Mr. Wade had a serious illness during that time. I'm aware. And you and Mr. Wade, I think you described your relationship in a lot of details um, earlier about specific circumstances. But you, you were business partners in, let's say, up till the time you left in uh, summer 2022, correct? That is correct. You were business partners up until that time. Uh, yes, I said yes, that, that is correct. Okay. And while you didn't socialize together frequently, you considered yourself a friend of Mr. Wade at that time? Yes, we were friends at that time, yes. All right. Uh, you are no longer business partners? That is correct. You are no longer friends? I mean, if he's saying that we're not friends, then uh, yeah. I want to know what you think, Mr. Bradley. Do you consider yourself a friend of Mr. Wade? I'll I consider. consider uh, goes to potential bias, Ms. Ms. Cross. Would I consider myself a friend of Mr. Wade? Mm -hmm. I would. You were asked questions, Mr. Bradley, about the circumstances under which you left the firm. <clears throat> do you recall those questions? I do. All right. And you left the firm. The firm remained the same as far as other employees, Mr. Wade, Mr. Campbell, as the main partners of the firm. You were the one who left, correct? That is correct. And you termed it as a disagreement. Do you recall answering questions as though you left due to a disagreement? Yes? Yes. And that disagreement was that there was an allegation of sexual assault by an employee made against you, correct? That is incorrect. There was not an allegation that you assaulted us, that you sexually assaulted one of the employees in the firm. That is incorrect, but yes. Yes. Yes, there was an allegation that you sexually assaulted a member of the firm, correct? Yes, there was an allegation, yes. And as a result of that allegation, you left? I did. You were no longer business partners with Mr. Wade? That is correct. The firm remained intact, and in fact, the employee involved remained with the firm, correct? I'm not certain of that. Um, they did leave the, the building, of course, um, and I don't know. Um, some of the employees did leave. Mr. Bradley, you in fact paid that employee twenty thousand dollars, correct? That is, in, uh, that is, that is incorrect, as far as what was. No. Honor about the time that you left the firm, and honor about the time that the allegation of sexual assault was made against you. Did you pay the person who had made the allegation of sexual assault any amount of money? There was money left in an escrow that belonged to me. I don't know what that amount was. And did that money that was left in the escrow that belonged to you, was that paid to the employee who said that you signed I never, I never signed any, I never gave any money. I never, I left the money in the escrow account. What happened to that money, um, I can't, I, I don't know what happened to it. For what purpose did you leave the money in the escrow account when you left the firm? I left the money in the escrow account. Um, For what purpose, sir? There was no purpose. You just left the money in the escrow account? Yes. If there's no connection to the money you left in the escrow account and the allegations of sexual assault that an employee of your firm made against you, why was it that you brought to my attention? Why did you respond? the way you did about money in an escrow account when my question was, did you pay this employee any money? I didn't hand any money 
Um, it's it was money from my escrow account, to my knowledge. Um, to your knowledge, where did the money in the escrow account go? To the employee. To that employee. Was there one allegation or one incident of sexual assault with this employee, Mr. Bradley, or was there more than one? It's one incident. There were not two. To my knowledge, there were not two incidents, no. I'm asking for incidents that you have been involved in. Were there two incidents where you sexually assaulted this employee? No, I didn't sexual assault anybody. Was there another occasion where you paid any money as a result of an allegation of sexual assault against you? No. Did you sexually assault any clients of your firm? No. Never? Never. Who's Anna Rodriguez? I don't even know that name. You don't recall a client named Anna Rodriguez? Anna Rodriguez? No, I do not. Never met her? I do not recall the name Anna Rodriguez. Pardon me, Honor. All right, Ms. Cross. Your Honor, this clearly goes to the bias that the witness has towards Mr. Wade and other individuals, his motive in okay. involvement. And I believe it's an appropriate, uh, appropriate avenue to pursue based on exploring his credibility. All right, at some point, though. I'm not going to go much further. Okay. Judge, if this is allowed to continue in this way, it does a little bit harassing, then is Mr. Bradley going to be excused from his privilege because oh, this is oh, not... Oh, oh, oh. That's what I was going to do. Don't do that. Mr. Chauvin. Sit on it. I think she's well. already done that. <laughs> um, Your Honor, I'm, I'm asking in all seriousness that privilege, although... Um, based on the answer right now, I think now we've opened up a whole area. Um, what he has just responded to, he previously said, was privilege. That doesn't sound like privilege to me. We'll have to address that when we go back through the run. Yeah. So, Miss Cross. I'm finished. Oh. <laughs> okay. Mr. Stay Down. You were accused by Mr. Wade of misconduct in the course of your representation of Mr. Wade, correct? I was not accused by Mr. Wade, no. Who accused you? Did, did Mr. Wade not, based on the questions we were just asked, did Mr. Wade not bring to your attention the sexual assault allegations? Ask that again, please. Mr. Wade brought to your attention the sexual assault allegations that you've been asked about by the prosecutor, correct? Correct. And at that time that Mr. Wade brought those allegations to your attention, you were still the attorney for Mr. Wade, correct? Correct. And therefore, your conduct as an attorney, and the attorney at that time for Mr. Wade was called into question by Mr. Wade's passing along to you allegations of misconduct, correct? I object to that. I don't think that's um, factually true. I don't know that that's not, I know that that is not legally true. The attorney-client relationship is of a matter. It is not initiated by other instances or anything outside that matter. I'm not sure that that's accurate. He was accused by Mr. Wade, his He's client. Do you mind if I speak? I allowed you to speak. Let's just say that. Mr. Wade, um, accused this gentleman of misconduct in the performance of activity while he's an attorney working with Mr. Wade and representing Mr. Wade. Those allegations of misconduct open up the question of whether or not he can defend himself by now discussing his confidential communications with Mr. Wade in connection with the representation as well as the allegations. That's the position of the defense. Understood. So what is the question you're putting? My question I'm going to ask you now is, tell us what Mr. Wade told you about um, 
when he began his relationship with Ms. Okay. Williams. All right, so uh, where I think we are with this is that Mr. Bradley previously testified that the reason he left the firm was totally and completely covered by privilege. When asked by the state, he went into a factual scenario that, to my mind, I don't see how it relates to privilege at all. And so now I'm left wondering if Mr. Bradley has been properly interpreting privilege this entire time. And I, I think the only way I can cure that is by having that in-camera conversation with him. May I suspend my redirect for you to have that conversation? Uh, I think that makes sense. But is there anything else though, that you were going to cover other than this issue? No. Okay. Ms. Cross, any reactions? Only to, Your Honor, Ms. the premise of Mr. Sadow's question was that Mr. Wade accused Mr. Bradley of the sexual assault. That was not my question, and I don't believe that's factual. Though there was an employee who accused Mr. Bradley of sexual assault. Okay. But re regardless, though, the point is, is that the circumstances of his departure from the firm, from what I've now heard, had nothing whatsoever to do with his representation of a divorce. Is that fair? My question, I believe the testimony has been that the circumstances of Mr. Bradley leaving the firm were related, I can't say how much, but certainly in a large part, based on the allegation of sexual assault that was made against him by employee. Sure. And his previous testimony was that that was totally covered by privilege? Yes, he lied. Okay. All right. Other than this issue, uh, which I think we've covered at length, uh, was there any other questions based on Ms. Cross's uh, examination from other defense counsel. Okay. All right. With that understanding, um, can this witness be excused, Ms. Merchant? All right. So, Mr. Bradley, uh, I would ask, I don't know if we we may be able to do it today. If we I'm could. sorry, because I don't well, think I could have seen Mr. Sadow had reserved the rest of his um, cross track Right. What I'm, what, I'm, what I'm about to say just logistically is what I'm trying to do is if we can conclude this hearing with the exception of that in-camera hearing, we end for today. And if as a result of that in-camera hearing that I learn that we need to reopen the evidence, then that's what I'll do. So to that end, um, I can give Mr. Bradley instructions that he's to report back if uh, upon order of the court, but otherwise... Um, is there anything further the parties need from him today? I know there's other housekeeping things and things we need to do. And based on our testimony, if you have another witness, Your Honor, it doesn't involve Mr. Bradley right. requiring to be here. Okay, so you so now the state does have another witness. I do. Okay. All right. In that instance, um, okay, Mr. Bradley, you can you can step down, sir. Uh, however, uh, I'm giving you. Uh, the order to stay in touch with your attorney, and then we're going to have to find a time uh, to meet again and go into an in-camera session. Do you understand, sir? I do. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. You can step down. Uh, Mr. Trooper, do you have a card for me? I, I do, Your Honor. Okay. At least I hope I do. I'm the worst lawyer on earth. I usually just tag bus stations with my. You can write down your contact information for us. I will. All right, Miss Merchant, do you have any further witnesses? No, Judge. Okay. Um, Your Honor, on the issue of the Bill Solinsky, one thousand six, first six eleven, we're not going to call him. We think the charge, the foundation of the source of the charge, is sufficiently in evidence, and we can just. Use the chart during argument under a six eleven demonstrative. Okay, and any objection to this uh, in, entry as a demonstrative, Ms. Cross? Uh, no, Your Honor. Given the parameters we discussed earlier. Okay. Can we go ahead and mark that an exhibit and make it part of the the record in advance of arguments? Since I don't think I don't know when we're going to be able to have that scheduled. I think this would be Defense Exhibit Twenty Eight. Let me let me go down the order just so we're staying organized. Ms. Merchant does not have any further witness. Excuse me. Mr. Mer Ms. Merchant, on behalf of Mr. Roman, has no further evidence. Uh, Mr. Sadow. Your Honor, we are in the process of allowing us to obtain certain phone records, um, and we'd like the record kept open for the introduction of those phone records. We have them in draft. We have them informally. We do not have certification. And they would 
deal with, remember I asked Mr. Wade about certain activity in down in Hayesville during the time period, uh, and it deals with that specific time period. And we're talking about uh, uh, February to March of 2021 to November 1st. And is it your intention that you would want to introduce these solely as an exhibit, or you think that this should reopen and bring us back for an entirely new evidentiary day with witnesses? I think that we would want to, if what we believe is there, based on our preliminary research, is there, we'd like to reopen and be able to introduce the records and someone to explain what this is. Thanks, Mr. Sagan. I believe so. All right. Uh, State would certainly have an objection to that. This hearing has been set. we haven't seen the records, so I, I don't know if I have any objection to what they are. Um, but the day has been set for quite a while. We object to leaving the evidence open for any, any purpose. Okay. And Mr. Sadow, when did you first go about trying to obtain these records? Um, I, I know it's also the Delta records. As soon as we got a hearing date in the state's response, so what happened was when the state responded, I think it was February 9th, um, and admitted to the relationship, but put parameters on the timing. Um, I said some needs have in response to that, so that's February 9th. <coughs> Problem is, Delta, at and all these folks aren't super fast about that. Um, and so I know Delta, we're also waiting, I wanted to remind the board, waiting for those records to be completed. And they, at t and actually emailed me these phone records yesterday morning on the way to court. Okay. All right. Any, um, any further exhibits that are self-authenticating? Um, if council are able to uh, provide those, obviously serve those on opposing counsel, and then before sending them over to us, uh, let us know whether they would be tendered with or without objection, just purely on authentication or hearsay issues or um, relevance. Uh, we can make those part of the record, and I'll reserve whether this reopens a full hearing format, but the exhibits themselves I'm willing to to have come into the part of the record, but there will be a cutoff point very soon, as soon as we schedule argument. All right. Uh, any other evidence, Mr. Say now then? No, Your Honor. So that would be cell records. Um, Mr. Stockton, no. any evidence? All right. Uh, Mr. Durham, if you're still with us? No, Your Honor. All right. Mr. McDougald? Sort of fact copies I mentioned to Your Honor yesterday. Your okay. And why don't you lay those out for the record? They. They are marked, but not yet numbered. Um, I believe our next exhibit would be 29. 28, I just said, was Mr. Gillen's demonstrative, just so I'm keeping it straight. And so I previously provided these to the prosecution. 29 would be a certified copy of County Code Section 2-68. Okay. 30 is a certified copy of County Code Section 2-69. 31 is a certified copy of County Code Section 2-79. 32 is certified copy of County Code Section 10-114. 33 is a certified copy of County Code Section 10-115. 34 is a certified copy of County Code Section 102-464. 35 is a certified copy of County Code Section 102-465. 36 is a certified copy of County Code Section 102-466. And 37 is a certified copy of an emergency motion by non-party deponent for protective order filed on behalf of D.A. Willis in the Wade divorce case. Okay. Uh, Ms. Cross, objection to defense exhibits 32 through 37. I object to their relevance, um, and I, I will take Mr. 
I was with opposing counsel's representation that the pleading is complete and accurate as it was filed, uh, and object to the relevance of that as well, but not the authentication. Okay. All right. We'll uh, note the objection for the record, and we'll admit them for whatever weight they're due. So <laughs> defense exhibits 32 through 37 are admitted. Uh, if you could hand those to Madam Court report. Any further evidence, Mr. McDougall? No, no. Okay. Mr. Rice? No, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Gillen? The demonstrative 38 or 28? Okay, and, and do you have a, a, a physical copy for us already? Great. All right, do we still have Mr. Kutchura with us on Zoom or anyone else on behalf of Mr. Floyd? He's not on any longer? All right, I'm being informed that he dropped off Zoom, and so I'll make a finding that he voluntarily has absented himself from this hearing. Mr. Cromwell? No evidence, yeah. Okay. Ms. Cross, back to you. Uh, um, if the defense presentation of evidence is done. I'd ask that all of the witnesses who had been subpoenaed but not called now be released. Uh, I think that's fair. Ms. Merchant, any reason to hold on any of those witnesses? Okay. The uh, state has two short witnesses, and uh, that's it. Okay, you may call your uh, next witness, Ms. Cross. Next witness for the state is Austin Dabney. <coughs> Impeach. Okay. Yes, um, my name is Austin Dabney. That's A U S T I N D A B N E Y. Good afternoon, Mr. Dabney. Good afternoon. I want to direct your attention. Well, first of all, how are you employed? I am uh, employed right now. I have my own firm. You're a um, lawyer and you've got your own law firm? That's correct. All right. I want to direct your attention to 2000 and 2021 2022. What was your employment at that time? Yes, I was employed um, with Way Bradley Campbell firm. And what that's Nathan Braid, Nathan Wade, Terrence Bradley, and Chris Campbell? That's correct. All right. And what did you do in that firm? Um, I was an associate attorney. All right. And don't need a whole lot of detail, but generally speaking, uh, who in the firm did you work for? What kind of matters did you handle? Um, well, I believe I worked for all of them equally. They would all give me tasks to do which court dates to go to, um, what cases to work on. I want to direct now your attention, uh, Mr. Dabney, to a particular instance. Um, did you have occasion at any time to go to a club with Mr. Bradley? Uh, could you repeat the question? Yeah. Did you have any occasion to go to a club, a nightclub or a, um, a bar situation with Mr. Bradley? Yes, I, I have. More than one time? Um, more than one time, yes. Uh, the time that I'm going to direct your attention to, uh, we spoke about a little earlier today. Do you recall any instance, Mr. Um, Dabney, where Mr. Bradley, where you witnessed, Mr. Bradley sexually assaulted. You are right. Yes, it's okay. Specific instances of sure. the impeachment is improper. All right. How is this not uh, extrinsic evidence in a collateral matter, Ms. Cross? Maybe ask a better question. Uh, my question will be if this witness witnessed Mr. Bradley sexually assaulting another employee of the firm. Same exactly. Subject. But same same subject matter. How is that not issue on a collateral matter for impeachment? I think it's not a collateral matter. You're on the witness denied it. I think it is uh, highly relevant. I think that it goes to the witness's credibility and his uh, denial here this afternoon that he committed the assault. There's a witness I will proffer to the court um, who has firsthand knowledge and witnessed the event. And so I think that's highly relevant to both Mr. Bradley's credibility and to the proceedings that we've had for the last two days. Still object, Your Honor. Oh, I understand, Mr. Um, 
this cross under 608, I don't see how this isn't well beyond the core facts at issue. I think you confronted with him. I think he answered them as he saw fit. An argument can be made as a result. But to go down a whole mini trial on whether and he did or did not do this and circumstances of his leaving the firm, I don't see how that gets past 608. I understand the ruling on it. I disagree and defer sure. my objection that I put a proffer on the record, not a detailed one, um, but that the... I think you already have. I'd like to, with the court's permission, I'd like to make it clear that the sexual assault I'm referring to was the same employee that I asked Mr. Bradley about. I just wanted that to be clear. Okay. All right. Understood. Is there anything else uh, that is relevant to this witness? Uh, given the court's ruling, no. All right. Questions from defense counsel? Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. When did you start working at the law firm? Um, I believe I started working, um, to my recollection, in March 2021. And at that time, do I understand that there was what I would call a, a three-way partnership or sharing arrangement at the law firm? Um, I'm not aware of any sharing arrangements that they had, but there was the way Bradley and Campbell Law Firm. And did you work in the law firm office on a daily basis? I did. And during the time period, you were there for the remainder of 2001? That is, you worked, you worked from March of 2001 at least to the end of 2001, correct? I wasn't, I didn't even have a bar license in 2001. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, 2021, a little late. From March of 2021 to the end of 2021, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, during the time period that you were working at the law firm, did you see Fonnie Willis? During my time, because you repeat the question. In that time period between March of 2021 and November 1st of 2021, did you see Miss Willis? I may have recalled one instance where I saw her in passing. And when you saw her, was she at the law firm? That would be correct. And do you know who she went to visit? I do not know. She didn't. You didn't see her go to Mr. Wade's office? I do not recall. Did you ever talk to Mr. Wade about um, Bonnie Willis? Could you repeat your question? Did you ever talk to Mr. Wade about Fonnie Willis during the time period of March of 2021 to November 1st of 2021? No. Did you know they were dating? No, I did not. Did you see anything between, did you ever socialize with Mr. Wade? As far as being an employee, yes. Well, I don't mean, I don't know what that means exactly, but did you ever go out to eat with Mr. Wade? <laughs> on occasion, he would take the office out to lunch. Um, beyond that, did you ever go to a nightclub or drinking or any of that with him? No, I did not. Okay, so whatever relationship Mr. Wade had with Miss Willis during this time period, you don't have personal knowledge, correct? I do not have any personal knowledge. Okay. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Any other questions from defense counsel? Mr. Stockton. When you started in March of 21, was that just you gave him a resume and started working there? I don't understand your question. When you started working there, is it a situation where your first day on the job is the first day you may have met him or, or shortly before you met him? Again, I don't, I don't understand what you're asking. Let me back up. Did you know Mr. Wade or any of his partners prior to March of 21? Yes, I did. How did you know them? In a professional capacity. I used to be a um, community supervision officer with the Georgia Department of Community Supervision. And what, where would that have been out of? Uh, Fulton County? Cobb County. How long did you know Mr. Wade prior to that? Um, I didn't see Mr. Wade in my professional capacity. I thought you were asking about all partners, but if you're only asking about uh, Mr. Wade, if you could please clarify. Okay, so you went to work for Mr. Wade in March of 21, correct? I went to work for the Wade Bradley Campbell firm. Okay. Prior to that, how long did you know Mr. Wade? I did not know Mr. Wade prior to that. At all? At all. No further questions. Any other counsel? 
All right. Seeing and hearing none. Any redirect, Ms. Cross? No, Your Honor. Subject to the court's ruling. All right. Can this witness be excused? No. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Next witness, Ms. Cross. Uh, I believe I know the court's ruling, so let me proffer that the next witness the state would call would be Anna Rodriguez. Uh, question, Mr. Bradley, about the sexual assault of Ms. Rodriguez, a client of the firm. He denied knowing her or recognizing her name. I believe Ms. Rodriguez's testimony would be impeaching of Mr. Bradley. I believe it's appropriate, um, but want to present that before I call it. All right. Thank you, Ms. Cross. And so, uh, based on that proffer and the subject matter proffered, uh, I still believe that that would fall under 608B is extrinsic evidence of a collateral matter. And so I don't think it's allowed under our rules of evidence. Understanding that, I just make a proffer on the record that um, Ms. Rodriguez would testify that Mr. Bradley sexually assaulted her. She was my client at the time. Um, and that would be impeaching of his testimony that he did not. All right. Understood. Any further uh, evidence or witnesses, Ms. Cross? Yes, okay. All right, then at this time, for now, I'll consider the evidence closed, subject to any certified submissions by counsel, and subject to the results of the in-camera hearing. Uh, we will coordinate with all counsel to find a date to come back for uh, summation. And um, to that end, uh, again, using Ms. Merchant as uh, kind of running uh, lead on this, uh, I'll I'd like you to consult on whether that's going to be a collective response on behalf of the defendants. If not, uh, then we're going to have to get into the time, time allotment. And if it's you know more than a handful of counsel, it would probably maybe be 10 to 15 minutes per side. And so, Mr. Sayon. When did you say this might happen? Uh, I'll, we'll follow up by email so we can coordinate with everyone's schedules. I want to make sure we have our same court reporter as well uh, so that the record is all in one place. And I know we have a lot of schedules to coordinate, but uh, looking at either late next week, as in next Friday, or the following week. And would we at least have the opportunity to get a transfer before we do that? I think that's probably highly unlikely, but we'll, we'll see. Uh, it's just uh, that would require a a rush, and I know, again, we're at a shortage of court reporters, uh, but I think there are other means you can refer to the evidence with confidence as to what was said. Miss right. um, Merchant. Okay. And like I said, we will. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna follow up with uh, scheduling. Mr. Gillen. And yeah, any other. Uh, Claims brought in any of the uh, the filings regarding forensic misconduct, this whole line of questioning. Right. All right. Any other questions from defense counsel? Anything from the state? Right, we would just ask that um, we be uh, allowed to submit a brief as it relates to um, the rulings that you just made as uh, brief relates to um, the objections by defense counsel under 607 and 6021, which is the impeachment by contradiction, which um, in the state's understanding would allow the use of extrinsic evidence to impeach the specific uh, testimony here of uh, Mr. Bradley. Um, so we're just asking for uh, leave to uh, provide a brief and uh, have the court to further uh, consider uh, your ruling. Well, if you still got your witnesses here and you think you've got a better legal argument, I'm willing to hear it. I don't, you said 607 and 608. 607 and 621. <laughs> Okay, I see 621 and I see 608. And, and in both of those instances, they allow testimony that uh, related to the testimony of another witness here, Mr. Bradley, that we can prove this is patently false as he testified that he didn't commit a sexual assault and that he didn't pay off witnesses and things of that nature. Okay, and how do you get around 608B's prohibition on extrinsic evidence of collateral matters? Both 607 and 621 allow the use of extrinsic evidence to specifically impeach uh, facts known to be false. But if that held true, respectfully, that would mean that any time a witness um, denied something, you'd be able to, of a, a matter testified to, you'd be able to impeach it in that respect, that's not true. Well, here's
here's what I'm fine with, uh, Mr. Abadi. If you want to submit that brief on purely legal argument, you can. But I don't want to have this as a vehicle to essentially put forth an extended and long-winded proffer of what you expected the evidence to be. So if you think I've made a legal error on that point, feel free to brief it, and we can reopen the, her the hearing if that's if that's legally invalid. Okay? All right. Um, Mr. Chopra, is your client still here? I believe so, Your Honor, but I'm sorry. They went the that's fine. Time. If he is still here, I'll, let's uh, relocate to the jury room. Okay. We will be uh, adjourned for today. Thank you all. Mr. Taylor, I don't, um, it logged out on me. Do you think it, yeah, do you think it lost battery or? I don't, I mean, I don't need it now. Uh, where are you going to put the, uh, the exhibit?